This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Once there was an elephant that tried to use the telephant. No, no, I mean the elephone that tried to use the telephone. However it was, has got its trunk entangled in the telefunk. The more it tried to get it free, the louder buzzed the telefee. Oh dear, I fear I'd better drop the song of Ellie Fop and Telefong. This is Safari Live. Good afternoon to all of you and welcome to the Sunset Safari where we are live from the Maasai Mara in Kenya as well as from the Sabi Sand in South Africa. I have to apologize to the author of that poem because I can't remember her name. I learned it when I was 10 years old and it has buzzed around in my head ever since. I'd love to know what else lives in there but I don't think we want to go down that road. My name is Jamie and this afternoon Fergus is nodding. Fergus is on camera with me and you can get hold of us by sending through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Questions, comments, and as we spoke about a couple of days ago, poetic criticism. But I didn't write that one. That one's not mine. Definitely not mine. Now, starting off with a herd of elephants, of course, you will have noticed, or those of you who are very observant will have noticed that the female that we were watching earlier oh, has a little backwards-facing tusk. Not quite as spectacular as the elephant back on Juma called Fang, but still very, very clear and very easily identifiable. Oh, I love gravity when it affects elephants. The way that they run down hills and then go up them again. Here come the rest, making their way over down. Trot, 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 trot. And then another dip. Trot, 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 and up the other side. This one, look, oh, look, Ferg, it's got a hat. Oh, we've got the, the baby elephant in front. Oh, no, the hat fell off. <laughs> There's a piece of, it's still got a few, a few strands. Yeah, it was a tasty hat, an edible hat, which actually would probably be the best kind of hat. I'd have the odd nibble every now and again. Baby elephant had grass all over its head. Because, of course, uh, as entertaining as that poem no doubt was, young elephants do actually have to learn to use their trunks. Not for telephone use, but in general, that whole process sometimes takes them a little while. There are lots and lots, between 50 and 100,000, depending on how you count them, different muscles in that trunk. Down the length of it, across it, and of course, diagonal as well. Melissa, elephants don't really wag their tails when they're happy, but you are absolutely correct in that the tail is very much an important mood indicator when it comes to elephants. So an elephant that is relaxed will have a relaxed tail, and yes, it sort of swishes from side to side. Um, when they are anxious or when they're upset, that tail is actually held out stiffly at a 90-degree angle to the bottom 
So it sticks out very, very, very stiffly. And when they are focused, and it's actually one of the, the interesting things when you are with elephants, especially when you're walking up to elephants, is you can usually gauge exactly when they've heard you or smelt you, even if they haven't moved much at all. And that's when their tail goes completely still. So when that tail's not moving, when it's held completely still, it doesn't mean that they're anxious because they might be used to people on foot, but it does mean that something has caught their attention. And most of the time, if you're approaching an elephant on foot, that is. I think that the, the author of that poem's name was Laura. Sorry, Meg, so you're going to have to repeat. You broke up a little bit there. You're just going to have to repeat the name. I know Fox Hat is the one who sent it through, and thanks, Fox Hat. I would have hated to try and pass that. No, well, not try, but I would have hated to have left that poem. Ha, huh, it was by Laura. Laura Elizabeth Richards was the lady responsible for that poem. I don't, if I remember correctly from when I was much younger and doing this drama I Steadford or whatever it was that I learned that for, I seem to remember she's no longer with us. But I, I like to think that if she were, she would have been appreciated the use of it in this context. Now, I'm sure you, you must have noticed this morning, we, we spoke about it this morning, throughout the day the wind has been howling, which makes conditions for searching for birds very tricky. Luckily, we film in two different locations. Let's go and find out if uh, Tristan plans on finding you some pretty birds today. Well, we do indeed, Jamie. We have a first look at another one of our summer migrants, the European beaters. So there's a nice little flock of them that is sitting on a tree and perched in the glorious summer sunshine. It is a scorching afternoon. It is really very warm. It's in the upper 80s Fahrenheit and close to about 30 degrees Celsius. So from the cold temperatures we've had recently, nice change. Now, my name is Tristan, as Jamie mentioned, and on camera, once again, I have Vim the Wildebeest. And well, it is coming to you live, like Jamie said, from two different locations. So you can ask lots of questions if you want to know about South Africa as well. And you can do that on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or the YouTube chat. Now, really nice to see the European beaters. They've unfortunately flown away while I've been sitting talking. But at least it's a first glimpse. We will see lots of them over the next few months as they glide around of from these dead trees catching all sorts of insects but it was good just to catch up with them it's been a long time since we've had european beaters on the camera i think how long since then will they I'd say three four months no more five months six months i forget where we are we're in october so no they were they would have left in april march april so somewhere around there so it's been a long time since european beaters have graced our screens and they are a very beautiful bird <coughs> lots of beautiful colors on them now, I was mentioning that it is quite warm. It's a bit of a shock to the system in comparison to what we had yesterday. And so, VM and I are both just kind of adjusting a little bit. And VM was saying we need to find a spotty cat, namely a leopard, because both of us are in withdrawal symptoms. And I think some of you might be too, because it's been a while since we had a leopard. We have been completely spoiled by all kinds of other things, but we definitely need our leopard fix. And so, VM reckons a leopard in the shade, and we get to spend some time while it's still hot in the shade ourselves. So, and that's what we're going to aim for for VM. Of course, we do need to go past Treehouse Dam to do our time lapse. We're all the way on Philemon's cut line, but I said to VM, and let's just go and have a little look around because this morning, with all the kind of commotion of the hyenas and then the tracking of lions and the leopard tracks that we had none of the guys actually came this way and checked so we it's a completely unknown entity the western side of juma and so we thought we'll just come and have a little look around and just see i also spoke to the guys about kajima and where they left him last night and apparently he was moving towards triple m but they didn't find tracks for him this morning so worth checking this side of the world maybe we get a little lucky and maybe we find something of interest now talking about interesting things there is my friend Taylor McCurdy who is always interesting and always quite bubbly and loud and well she's rearing to go on a chilly sounds like afternoon in the Mara and so let's go across to her so she can give you a warm welcome from her side. <laughs> she, she just say I'm always interesting. Maybe not as interesting as this hyena who we've got out trying to keep nice and warm on the sand. There's actually you know, quite a few animals out today in the wind. I'm surprised because it's not been very pleasant. A few elephants too. Just scattered around on this very 
a very, very blustery day, and we'll get a little bit closer in a minute. But um, how's the safari going, everybody? My name is Taylor, and on camera with me today is Jahawi, and we're hoping to find all sorts of wonderful things. So remember to hashtag Safari Live. Remember to chat to us via the YouTube chat. You can send us any questions. You can do anything you like, really. So I'm going to go a little bit further around from this hyena. Uh, so it's been a pretty miserable day around camp today. Everybody was... Uh, holding down their tents basically trying to not let them blow away it's the windiest day i've ever experienced in the mara it was sort of like a gentle breeze in the eastern cape of south africa and you know it was chilly and windy when you see an animal like a hyena and typically they're nocturnal but it's not uncommon to see them during the day but the fact that it's come and laid out on the road we know that they love to do this to try and keep nice and warm and it's also a little bit sheltered there see that little bit of a depression the grass is a lot taller than the hyena too so it'll be keeping out of the wind now this is one of the many hyenas that we see in this area and around the escarpment they come and hassle us in camp because they absolutely love to do that don't you looks like it was also a little bit wet at one point maybe maybe earlier but not too bothered by us not too interested just wanting to keep warm and enjoy itself okay we're going to keep moving on we're going to try and find some big cats so i had a mild panic today like a serious panic. I even thought I was going to be late for safari. Don't tell anyone. Because I lost Maurice. I was almost murdered by Rebecca. Uh, basically what had happened is, I, I don't know how Maurice ended up outside of the car, but I was sitting in the car and we were driving to go and fetch Joseph, who's our Scari this afternoon. And I went, where's Maurice? Where's Maurice? Searching everywhere. I unpacked everything 10 times. And then I just said to Ja, I was like, I'm not, I'm not going on safari without Maurice, not at all. So we raced around and I checked carefully on the road to make sure he didn't fall out. He had fallen out, He'd fallen out in front of final control. It was a very, it was actually quite a morbid scene because he was just sort of laying there in the stones. And I tried to very sneakily pick him up off of the ground, but Rebecca was standing at the door and she was watching me. And then when she realized what had, what had happened, uh, yeah. I thought that was going to be the end of me. You may almost didn't ever see me again. And so that was that was scary, but he's here. He's safe now. He will live in my camera box because I feel like that's probably a good spot. And then he can't fall out. For the drive, he can just sit there. I also went on a wonderful hike, in case you were wondering what I did today. I'm going to show you where I went hiking. But we might only be able to show you a little bit later. Well, in about 20 minutes when we get around to that side. We went serious rock climbing though, it was amazing. We found a waterfall, well it will be a waterfall, it was just trickling once, uh, once we have some decent rain, which I suspect we'll get in the next few days. Uh, it's going to be um, unbelievable, I can't wait to go back there. And there was this view that opens out onto the Sausage Tree Pride territory, so when we go around there I'll show you. And there's these two little pools that are filled up. And it's perfect, it's like a bush jacuzzi. You could just sit there and stare at the animals down below you. They're really amazing. So that's quite nice. So I'll have to take Scott there because Scott also enjoys hiking and he just got back from his adventure. Uh, so I think he'll be joining us from tomorrow. And quite nice, just relaxing. You know what holidays are like. You need a holiday after your holiday. They get a bit exciting sometimes. So we'll have to go hiking there and, uh, and see. But we must go when, when we've had lots of rain though. We have to go when it's lots of rain. So we're going to head around that way. We might as well check for the Sausage Tree Pride, see if those ladies have come out. And then I shall show you the spot that I went rock climbing today with David and Craig. But in the meantime, I'm going to send you back across to sunny South Africa where Tristan is looking for spots and he's checking the watering holes. I am indeed, Taylor. It's a hot afternoon, and so uh, water holes feel like a good place to start. And we had a little warthog in a, in a mud wallow. Unfortunately, decided as soon as we stopped that it was going to do its best diker imitation and literally put its tail between its legs, or actually, sorry, above its bum, and run and fly off into the bushes. So we unfortunately lost that fairly quickly. But water holes, I feel like at this time of the day, maybe it's a little early to be checking them. It's still searingly hot, and so a lot of the animals are probably still sitting in shade for now, and they'll only come down to water a little bit later. But you never know. None of this area was checked this morning, and so ultimately Treehouse Dam seems like a good place to actually start and to try and Sort of figure out what's been going on on this side of the world. So far it doesn't look like too much has moved around. Hello little Steenbok. 
We didn't see you there until the last minute. There's a very relaxed male Steenbok that's just giving us a stare down. It's almost like if you're going to challenge me, then you're going to have to come... Well, if you want to use this road, you're going to have to challenge me, is almost the way he's looking at us. Now, the Steenbok lately have seemed to have been far more relaxed than normal. We've had a lot of sightings, really close sightings. Maybe it's because I've got a wildebeest on the back of the vehicle and they feel a lot more comfortable with the antelope brethren as we move around. Who knows? But the, the Steenbok are definitely, at this stage, far more relaxed than what I've been seeing lately in previous sort of months. It's really quite strange to have long visuals of Steenbok and enjoy them for long periods of time. And you can see that this little one is having a full go at some stalks there. Now, the interesting part about this is that the Steerenbok, you would think, would be trying to maximize the nutrients that are around you after a dry winter and be feeding off more green shoots, the shoots that are growing after the rain that we've had and, you know, the warm temperatures started the growth of grass. But it seems as though it's chewing on rather old, dry stalks. Now, I wonder why that is. It's strange thing for Steenbok to do. The thing about them is that they can survive in even the harshest climbs because, well, they get moisture from dew and all kinds of other things and they also have a ruminating system so they're able to maximize every little bit of nutrients. But I don't know if maybe there's a little plant growing in amongst the grass that it's actually feeding off. Maybe that's what's happening and I'm just missing it with all the glare. I can't see that nicely if it's feeding off little leaflets or if it's feeding off grass. And it seems like little leaflets on that tree. So I suppose that makes more sense. Palin, I think, <laughs> difficult to say. I mean, these Steenbok do really well in the hottest part of the day. They they really are able to kind of, they being small animals, don't actually lose too much moisture. They also are able to kind of find places and lie down. They're a lightish color, which means they're reflecting light a lot better. So they do fairly well. Um, I'm just trying to think what else would be kind of mid part of the day. Everybody really suffers a little bit. It's not easy for any of these animals, and that's why most of them try and find shade. You'll very seldom find a lot of animals right out in the sun in the middle part of the day. Everything will try and find shade, and, and, and you'll find that they'll try and utilize any technique to try and keep cool. So from panting, rapid breathing, to drinking, to shade, to areas where there's a breeze that's blowing. It just depends on the species. So I don't think any species is really comfortable, but these Steenbok are definitely one of them that doesn't do too badly when it's really hot and dry they tend to be ones that kind of survive quite well you find that the ones that really suffer are the cats they ultimately are the ones that have the worst time during the hot part of the day particularly things like male lions that big collar of fur is highly uncomfortable and very hot and, and it's sometimes why you see in summer months that the manes actually don't s seem to be appear as full as they do in the winter months and that's just because they lose a little bit of their hair and it kind of gets a bit thinner just to deal with the hot weather that we have out here so Steenbok what else I'd say probably your impalas are okay um, zebras tend to be all right Vil the beasts are not too bad so you are very relaxed oh there we go a few bound but it took a while for that steenbok to actually kind of decide to move now of course you'll find things like buffalo and elephants and and the likes will often utilize water in order to try and sort of cool themselves down so they don't actually cope well with heat but they they are able to find ways to to cool themselves down and, and obviously elephants have these ears and, and that helps them and but they'll all try and find water and mud wallow and, and soak their skin and try and cool down using water which a lot of the antelopes can't do because ultimately they're not big enough to be able to stay away from things like crocodiles and also being in a mud wallow is sometimes a risky business because if things like lions come around and they're able to surround you or they get sneak up with you on you you can't get away as quick in water and so really wallowing is left to most of the big animals except for maybe warthogs who have the right kind of skin for it as well they don't have as much hair and therefore it's not as difficult to also groom out right now we are approaching treehouse dam will there be some luck it's been a while since we've had anything at treehouse dam we we had a good run for a while and, and lots of sightings of cats and leopards and all kinds of things here and it seems to have gone off the boil a little bit so I'm going to just check and hope that maybe just maybe something's lying around just somewhere Ah, 
Uh, Jerry, this is a very good question and one that's quite pertinent to this time of the year. You're saying with all this heat around, how often do wildfires start or happen in Juma? Well, Jerry, the thing is, is, is not that often just because we tend to put anything out that starts. We, as soon as we see a fire, we put it out. And the reason for that is because of we have situations where we have lodges and, and vast tracts of land can't just go left when something is burning. So it's not that common. Um, but yes, it can happen. Lightning strikes, particularly now as we start going into the summer and we get these big thunderstorms at night, big bouts of lightning can definitely cause a fire to start. And in my time in the sands, I've seen a couple really big fires. We had a major fire in 2010, another one in 2011, and then there was a really big one again in 2014. So they happen quite regularly. Um, some of them, unfortunately, are actually arson. And so that's a lot of the time poachers, particularly rhino poachers, that will try and light a fire very close to the boundary of the reserve. And the reason why is as soon as there's then the next rains, that grass starts to grow where it's burnt and that's nutrient rich grass. It's really good grass. And so rhinos particularly will head into that area and it makes it much easier for poachers to be able to hunt them. And so that does happen from time to time. But natural fires do also occur. Lightning strikes cause a few fires to rage in this sort of time frame. So normally September, October, November are all the dangerous months for fire. And even now you can see the bushes not exactly wet and not exactly very green. And that means that there's still a big risk at the moment. Now there's actually a warthog busy walking off. I was talking about mud bathing warthogs. It's unfortunately disappearing though. I don't think we're going to be able to get a view of it. Maybe. It's just hide, doing its best hiding impression right behind a tree. And so I was hoping it might come out. Oh, there we go. It's running off now. So we'll just leave that. Now, of course, it's also time to get Viam on camera once again because he's going to go and do our time lapse. Thank you, Viam. So Viam is uh, not wrapped up nearly as much as what he was a few days ago. He's far more summery, although he's still got long pants on, which is, I'm sure, quite hot and warm. Say hello, Viam. There we go. There's Viam waving to everybody, smelling like his vanilla cake again. Palin, yes, wildfires are a crucial part of certain vegetation. This area here, it, we do need wildfires at times, and so what happens is because we put out a lot of the fires due to safety concerns for lodges and people and all of those kind of things, fires will be replicated. So they will have a fire program, basically, where certain blocks or certain portions of land are burnt in a rotation through the years and they'll try and get a situation where it's kind of depending on the vegetation type and depending on soil types and all these kind of things certain vegetation responds to more frequent burning uh, than others and so you'll find a situation where they'll rotate burn certain sections and that will then do the job but we're not as reliant as fire as some of the other parts of South Africa so down in the Cape where there's a Feinbos system Feinbos needs fire pretty much every season in order to really sustain itself and survive we don't have that situation here. We just need fires every now and then to be able to keep a lot of the moribund, which is built up grass and stumps and various other things, gone, and then also just to rejuvenate certain areas. Now you can hear the Egyptian goose are very unhappy at the moment, and the reason why is because I think there's an intruder that came in, and that's why there's lots of honking and hissing, and there it actually comes. Now I wonder if there's going to be a lot more noise made as this one decides to fly over. There we go, you see how the wings are out is because what an individual flew over that's not welcome and so they were displaying with their wings out calling saying this is our waterhole stay away from here you are not welcome now it is going to land there and you see as soon as it lands and actually stops flying the others quiet and down which is fairly pleasant too because egyptian geese do make a serious amount of noise but well done it was a good landing considering you have webbed feet so not easy to perch when you have webbed feet they're not like the passerines or the starlings and various others that are able to but now this one is going up and i think it's going to try and make a bit more noise now i wonder if there's going to be a third one that's going to jo join up there now it could have be a situation where it's adults with their young ones but i think it's more an intruder just given the amount of noise that we've been hearing right 
everything's settled. I think that's it. Everybody's now decided we all know each other. We're all okay. No more squawking and squeaking for now. And that's about it to Treehouse Dam. Unfortunately, our little dry spell at Treehouse continues when it comes to the cats or actually any animals. We really haven't seen too much around Treehouse Dam. There's been a few impalas and various other things, but that's about it. There's not really been much in the way of elephants or even buffalo or anything like that. And so hopefully Treehouse will start to come into its own again. The more we have these hot weather sort of situations and no rain, the more treehouse and twin dams start to become the places to go to. It's much like what we saw in, in September when it was very dry and these were the only two dams that held water, a lot of animals made their way towards here because all the mud wallows didn't have water and so you had a situation where and these dams were vitally important for the sustainability of the animals in this area and I think we're going to head back into a situation like that. I've been checking a lot of the mud wallows over the last few days and they're all starting to dry up now. There's very few that are left. Now one animal that we do see quite a lot around this area is the waterbuck and so they generally are around. It's also a good indication that not much has been hanging around the dam itself predator wise because waterbuck funny enough are quite perceptive creatures. I find that they are difficult for the predators to hunt even though they do catch them from time to time they tend to be quite alert and quite sort of aware of what's going on and if there's a predator around they generally move quite far away they're not like the impalas that will move a short distance and then carry on feeding but the waterbuck tend to move a long way away and try and find somewhere else but you can see that waterbuck has found itself a little oasis so there's a seep that is coming through and bright green grass which is probably super tasty it's also probably nice and cool underfoot as well and so that makes a perfect place to graze. James, you are asking which antelope did I say was the least adaptable to the heat? Probably, oh, that's a difficult one actually. I didn't say anyone in particular. I was, I was saying that things like buffalo and, and the rhinos and those kind of things need to use mud and, and water in order to be able to control their body heat because of their size and just their general coloration. They absorb a lot more heat than uh, the lighter colored animals. But I would say in terms of antelope species, I would say the ones that suffer the most probably are the waterbuck. The waterbuck has a much thicker, denser fur than all the other animals. And I would say in summer months, in the hot temperatures, waterbuck must really have a tough time with it. It's, it can't be comfortable being covered in so much fur and so they have to try and adapt to that and use a lot of shade and, and hang around cooler areas which is normally drainage lines where water is normally occurring in summer. When you get drainage lines it's areas that water will flow in and so it's not generally a little bit cooler in those kind of areas and so you find that they'll hang around in those sections. I'd imagine Nyala males also must have a tough time in the summer. All that fur just can't be easy at all to deal with so those would be the two although I don't know the actual answer in terms of scientifically oh, I just want to see here I thought I saw a footprint no I don't think so hello impalas there's a couple impalas that are drifting off as well now I didn't do it you want to know if waterbuck are able to sweat now I'm not 100% sure about this because their seba sebaceous glands, which are their glands that are in their skin, they typically release obviously this s substance that helps to just repel water and coat their their fur. Now whether or not they sweat, I'm actually seriously not 100% sure. I don't know. I'll have to go and do a bit of researching for you and see whether they do. I would imagine there must be some way that they can cool themselves down so that maybe they have a system where they've got rather large nasal openings that they are able to breathe and air is kind of transferred from there and cooling down blood vessels in the nose much like the oryx or they have a situation maybe that they do sweat and secrete some sort of moisture that perspiration can take place now at the top of that tree uh, what have you spotted because i think we've spotted different things Oh, the kudus. No, I was looking at the top of the tree. And one is it was a sunbird and two was the violet-backed starling. But it's right at the top of that tallest tree in the sort of center part. 
there was a beautiful what looked like a white bellied sunbird that was flying around in there and then there was also a violet backed starling which I think is the one on the right hand side but well spotted on the kudu at least at least you saw something that I didn't and I think the kudus are probably making their way towards Treehouse Dam as well and to go and just find some shade and some water so we're going to carry on and see what else we can find and see what else is out here I believe Jamie has found something that again I wish we would see here because they are absolutely exquisite birds to see Although the windy weather might not be particularly good for birding, there's certain birds, of course, that are unmistakable and out whatever the weather. This morning we spent a bit of time with a secretary bird, and this afternoon we're going to spend time with one of the most spectacularly extravagant birds of the Masai Mara, the crowned crane. And we've got a pair of them that are really playing with us, Fergus, at this point. They, they, what they'd be doing is, is disappearing behind this patch of bushes and then you think that you've got them out on the right side and then all of a sudden they change their minds and they come out. There we go. So a little Tommy, Thompson's gazelle on the left. And I can completely understand why Tristan feels a little jealous that we get crowned cranes here and not in Juma. Is There's certainly some really special aspects to the birding in the Maasai Mara but of course there's other birds on Juma that are equally intriguing but none of them have quite such a fine crown as the crowned crane not that I can think of anyway they're so striking and so almost alien looking in their design so absolutely, I understand. Don't worry, Tristan, your time, your time will come. So of course, this afternoon, hi guys. This afternoon will be Fergus's last drive in the Mara for a while. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And possibly my last drive for, for two weeks while I'm on leave. So we're bumbling without any particular purpose. We are bumbling in the direction of Brent's Lions from this morning though. Arena, you say it almost looks like they went to the beauty shop. I know, absolutely. You almost expect them to have matching toenails on the tips of their feet. They definitely look as though... And it's that straight out of the hair salon look. It, it's not the day after or anything like that. It's the straight after. It stands up so perfectly. Everything is so perfectly in place. My favorite part of the crowned crane, which I, I don't know. It's the part for me that I find the most beautiful is not so much the the, the wattle or the or the crown or the russet colored tail feathers it's actually the the gray white transition on their necks and it's sort of almost a blue gray and the, the way that it feathers out so it looks like a gradual shading change of course now because i've mentioned that now that neither of them want to face us which is quite inconsiderate there we go that's my favorite part of a crown crane grabbing at various insects and seeds. Um, Carl, that's a good question, because we know that this is a, is a pair of a male and a female. Now, you want to know if we can differentiate between the male and the female. Now, as far as I know, there they are. there's no sexual dimorphism, so they're very similar. But what I'm trying to just double check is to see if the male or the female is bigger. Now my suspicion would be that the, what am I looking up, crown crane? That the, um, that the male would be, would be larger rather than in the situation like a, a, a raptor where the female is larger. But I'm honestly not sure, but there's no, there's no striking or immediate difference. It's not like a batelier or anything like that where you can immediately tell from the difference in coloration. Or, for example, like a saddle-billed stork. I'm just wondering if perhaps the female... I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure if one, if one is slightly larger than the other. And checking up on myself, there's no info on it that I can access easily. I'm sitting with my, with my bird book just double-checking. And I can't find anything about it. 
So no, I don't think that there is a, an obvious and immediate difference. Right, so we've already spoken about the fact that these birds look like they've been to the hair salon. It seems as though it's a day of luxury all around for the different animals. And Taylor's buffalo are enjoying some time at the spa. They are indeed, Jamie. And the funny thing is, is that we're at exactly the same mud wallow. With I wonder if it's the same buffalo that we watched yesterday doing the, exactly the same thing rolling about and just enjoying themselves although today they seem to be covered in a lot more mud I feel as though they've put a bit more effort into smearing that beautiful stinky slimy terrapin infested mud all over your body I can't imagine that would be nice I wonder what do you think about this Jahami because my mind wonders sometimes do you think it would be easier for a buffalo to get away if it's just had a mud wallow like this from a lion jumping on it. Do you think the lions would slip trying to grasp onto them? Maybe. <laughs> I don't know why I just thought of that, but I, I would imagine if I were to go and touch that buffalo now, my hand would just slide right off. It's, it, it's full of clay. And I think, I think, I don't think a lion would be as easily be able to hold onto a buffalo if it, if it just freshly come out of a mud wallow and it was covered in head to toe. So not when it's dry, when it's slippery like that. I wonder. Now we'll have to add that to our list and watch lions hunting buffalo after they've just wallowed. That would be an interesting sighting, wouldn't it? <laughs> oh, Unkai, very creative. You said, what a lovely buffalo akuzi. Very nice. I like that. We may have to take that. It's now ours. We're going to be using buffalo akuzi from now on to describe buffaloes in a mud wallow. So thank you very much, Umkar, for that. Um, but yes, they are. They're, they're just going to relax it for most of that. There was actually a third one, but it's disappeared behind the car now. And I, I'm quite happy that these boys are fairly relaxed. I mean, they're, they're watching us. They're staring at us. They keep pointing their noses to the sky every now and then. And I'm sure when I start my car again, they're going to have an absolute heart attack. But, they, but they're but they fairly tolerant of, of the vehicles, these fellas. I mean, we must only be about five or six meters away from them. We're not far at all. You can hear them as well <sighs> snorting. That might also be the, the flies. You can see they're very annoyed by those biting midges. Oh, this is lovely. So you can guess what we're trying to do then. If you watched yesterday, you should remember that this is where the sausage tree pride were. Uh, now, Dede, Tommy, you said that you can hear your mom shouting, get out the mud. Yep, that sounds like my mother too. I was also always in the mud. I was the dirtiest child ever. I'm still pretty dirty. I cannot stay clean. I'll put clean clothes on before every single game drive. And then I just walk to the car. I don't even have to touch it. And I'll look down and I'll have grease somewhere or there'll be a mud stain. It's an absolute nightmare. And, and never, this is a, a word of the wise, never trust a safari guide that hasn't got dirt on either their face or their hands or somewhere on their clothing. Because I don't know how, as a guide, you do not get dirty. It's absolutely impossible. Maybe Jamie. I wonder if Jamie will agree with you. Jamie's fairly clean, though. Her clothes always seem to stay very clean. Brent, Brent will agree. Brent has always got some form of a mud stain on, on his body somewhere or dust or whatever it may be. Scott, oh, no, he keeps it pretty tidy. I don't know how I managed to do it. I think if, if I was going to be an animal, I'd, it would, I'd end up being a buffalo because I'd just be dirty all the time. Or a warthog, maybe. Or a hyena. Any one of those. They all like mud just the same. Big shake, getting all that excess mud off. Now, it's quite cool. Uh, obviously, in South Africa, you know that we do walking. And um, we're always looking for fresh signs of uh, animals because you don't want to intentionally walk into a buffalo and when a buffalo has wallowed like this when they walk you can actually see that they leave a trail and if you just follow that route on the floor especially where the road passes where that buffalo has just walked over you can actually see the mud on the ground you see that so that's how you would tell that something has walked there and you know, maybe the ground would be too hard and you wouldn't see a footstep but there's also buffalo dung there so that gives it away so you would look for um a, a track or some dung to identify what had been in that wallow and then he's going to smear mud all along the grass that he walks on now and only tomorrow it will probably dry or maybe a little bit later today 
can see where they've been walking and laying. Now, Mr. P, you're wondering if the mud kills all the ticks. Uh, it does. It helps suffocate them, especially if they've submerged themselves in the wallow for quite some time. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why they, of course, do it, to keep cool. And then it also helps get rid of the parasites. And then you've got the terrapins. We saw a terrapin yesterday moving in between the legs of the buffalo. So they love, absolutely love it when they can find an engorged tick on a buffalo. They'll quite happily just pull them off. So it's a bit like the ox peckers, but but not quite, slightly different. I don't think they're as effective as an ox pecker. But let's carry on. Let's um, actually, yeah, let's, uh, let's look for these lions because that's what we said we were going to do. I don't know where the sausage tree pride li of lions uh, ha have disappeared to. They do this to me all the time. I might have to stop talking about them for a while and give them a bit of the silent treatment until they start behaving better. I mean, they were my go-to lions at one point. I think all of our go-to lions. We. Down we go. So we'll we'll drive about on the escarpment for a little bit longer. We're always looking for that female cheetah that has been seen a couple of times along here. Uh, hopefully we'll find either. Tristan has he's obviously left Treehouse Dam and he's on to his next one. It's one of my favorite. Let's go across to Tristan at Twin Dams. Well, Tin Dams is looking very different to what it normally does. And overnight, because we were here yesterday, so I know this, it has sprung up with blue-green algae and lots of it. There is this green sludge that has come through now. And I wonder if it's to do with a bit of the heat and rain that there's all of a sudden this thick green sludge-like algae that has grown on the surface. It is a really beautiful color and it is vibrant and it is green, but it is not great. It's not the best thing to have in water. And if you get too much of this blue-green algae, it can actually be toxic to animals so it's something that needs to just kind of be watched but it does happen when dams are drying and the end of the rain season often why that happens is there's an over sort of fertilization and it's because water levels or water percentage gets less animals defecate and urinate and all kinds of other things inside there and so this blue green algae has a lot of nutrients that it can feed off and then it grows quite quickly especially with hot weather so as soon as you get hot sun then you find that the algae populates quite quickly so it looks crazy it's but it's and it's amazing how fast this is has happened because four or five days ago there was not even a single drop of this stuff and now it is spread all across and I want to actually watch it and see over the next few days will this carry on or will it still kind of dissipate out and we'll see a situation where it was just a bloom of algae and that was the end of it. The other thing about Twin Dams today which is very noticeable is how quickly it's drying. It seems to be moving a lot faster than normal. If you look on the edge of the water hole itself you can actually see a massive ring where the water is dropping as we speak so it's it's basic well not as we speak but it's dropping as the days are going on when you get a dark section like that that is an area where water once was in the last few hours or days at least a day probably would be at the most sorry and that would mean that this is drying very fast much faster than the rate that we saw a few weeks ago during the winter but it's probably because of the increased temperatures although it's been two cold days prior to this the other thing that i managed to find which was crawling over my knee while i was sitting here looking at the algae is this beautiful beetle it's got the most incredible markings. It's a very cryptic kind of marking, coloration. It's busy trying to shelter from the sun. So I'm going to help Viam and just not get two tones there because otherwise Viam has a problem with balancing the light. But look at that coloration. Now imagine this little beetle on a sort of barked tree like a marula or something like that where there's a little bit of white speckling this is just going to blend in incredibly well and be super difficult to spot so the camouflage on this beetle is absolutely insane now i think it is one of the click beetle species it looks like the right shape for a click beetle i might be wrong but i think it is it's got the right sort of long body and then that biggish head and why they're called click beetles is because and i tried to see if it, it, it would click when i took it off my knee and it didn't so i'm a bit that's that's why I'm a bit skeptical, but the shape is right. But why they would be called click beetles is generally if you look on their head, so I'm just going to use my finger so you can see a size difference. There is the head, and then you've got the thorax and the abdomen. Now the thorax has got this hard shell over the top of it, and that would then overlap with the wing casing. And so what happens is, is as they get picked up, they will, or if they sort of fall and they fall on their back, you'll find a situation where they click 
their head to try to get away and it makes this loud sound like essentially a clicking sound and that's how they will revert themselves back onto their feet if they fall on their back or sometimes even wiggle their way through from a predator because a predator hears the sound and gets a little bit nervous and moves off so i think it is one of the click beetle species i might be wrong if, if i am wrong let me know hashtag safari live if you know what this beetle exactly what this beetle is but i think it's of that particular family but isn't it beautiful regardless of what species it is the markings on this beetle are absolutely wonderful these browns these greys these whites and i'm thoroughly enjoying seeing all of the arthropods back in this starting to slowly but surely come out so it's been wonderful to find all these weird and wonderful little creatures in the vehicles in the mornings and generally just around the camp and all kinds of other places so been quite nice now i'm a bit worried about this beetle getting sort of falling off so what i'm trying to do is i think i'm just going to try and put it back on my jersey which is where it was in the car and leave it there for the rest of the day and it can decide what it wants to do later tonight because ultimately it must have come from the camp area and i don't want to take it out of an environment that it normally works but it is going to go for a nice long drive Riti and many others, you're wondering if the water could cause stomach issues to the animals and many others. Well, yes, it can cause a problem. It can cause diarrhea, which obviously then leads to dehydration and possibly then death. And so blue-green algae poisoning is something that we have to watch out for. It, it, not last month, the month before, in August, there was a bit of an outbreak of it in another dam not too far from here. Um, and there was actually a zebra that died from it. And so it can be a bit of a problem. But most of the time, the animal's constitutions are so strong that they are able to deal with this. And as long as they don't deal and drink from the side where the algae is, so you see that algae is all kind of pushed into one corner, they should be fine. If they drink from the other side, which is the sort of shallower side, there's no algae there. And so theoretically, they should be okay. The concentration of that water over there should be enough to kind of allow them to drink and not be affected in any way but it is something you ultimately have to watch if the entire area and the entire twin dams sort of portion becomes one solid thick layer of that blue green algae scum then it's not a good thing at all and you'll find actually the animals won't drink there they'll just literally come and they'll look and then they'll walk off and go to the next one so it's probably been brought about by a duck somewhere else or a egyptian goose or maybe a lapwing that brought the spores from another pan that had it you might and especially now because we've had this we had that rain where a lot of these small pans filled up and with the heat and these small pans and the nutrient rich environment that those small pans are algae blooms happen quite quickly and so as those are drying birds are moving around in there some animals are moving around in there they then fly to the next water hole like this and they transfer those algae blooms and then you get a big outbreak of it so as soon as we get rain though you'll find that that will disappear completely and you won't have it anymore and, and a little bit more water then it will be okay so um, hopefully the rains will come and clean out twin dams a little bit but it's nothing to worry about just yet there's still lots of water there that's clean and doesn't have as much it's just amazing to see how quickly that algae grew because like i say yesterday there was probably i would say an eighth of how much algae we saw there today so it is quite pretty interesting just to watch how quickly fungi can grow and and bacterias and those kind of things populate you know the small microorganisms often move a lot faster than everything else in terms of their lifespans and their growth and their taking over of an area Right, Mulawati it is, I think, given that it's hot, given that it's bright, it's sunny, it's really not easy to kind of see at the moment. It's quite glary this afternoon, and so I think Mulawati is a great place just to have a little look around, just to see what there is and just kind of meander through the shady sections. Maybe we get lucky and something's been walking around in this area. I don't know. Obviously, it's just potluck as to what we can get out here. I don't think we have saw any signs of animals coming into this area this morning, and so it's more just about having a little meander and just enjoying the beauty of the riverbed in this sort of hot afternoon it's a great place for a number of the animals to be resting and so look out for anything inside here you can find pretty much any kind of animal in this particular section there's lots of tracks for nyala and kudu and all kinds of other antelope species that have been moving around in this particular area which is good news so hopefully we will find something now what is that over there vm you see it's in the top of those branches i think it's a forktail drongo but i might be wrong um the one that's going at a 45 degree angle off the bank 
I think it's now moved. No, there it is in the background of that tree. There we go. So what are you? No, you're a scimitable. That's very cool to see. It's been a while since I've seen a scimitable and it's got some sort of prey item. You see that? It's got an insect or something. So it's managed to catch itself a meal, which is very cool. Now these scimitables are tough to get on camera because generally quite flighty. We see a lot of the green wood hoopoos and it's the same family and you'll notice though that this has got a dark beak and not the red beak that we see in the green wood hoopoos. It's also a much more black purple color than green and these guys are generally on their own or in a pair not in groups like we see so much harder to get onto camera much more silent they don't make nearly as much noise as the green wood hoopoos so that's quite a cool bird to see it's not one that I've seen in a while and certainly not one that I've had on camera in quite some time so super glad that we managed to find it also the fact that it's got a kill is very cool i can't see what it is it's a flying insect of some sort that it's managed to grab and this is the great place the great thing about being in riverbeds is you just don't know what birds you're going to find there's lots of insects around in these areas as well and so the greatest place for hunting birds like these scimitables that go after insects you'll find also a lot of kingfishers in these places a lot of different other insect eaters that will spend time around here and there we go down the gullet it goes and you can see their beak is very unique in comparison to a lot of other birds they've got these long curved beaks and they will use them to go into wooded areas and dig out wood boring insects and various other sort of insects that are flying around in this area very very cool to see so that was very nice like I said you never know what you're gonna get in a riverbed it's always worth just bumbling around and looking lots of birds around generally and it's a really a great place to be and I can tell you that most of us that present here at Safari Live absolutely love this little section and spend a lot of time here whenever we can now talking about sort of other presenters I believe Taylor McCordy has managed to find some luck this afternoon and find something that I hope that we might see as well today I suppose we do all love the Mulwati. It's a beautiful place, especially on a hot summer's day, to escape that heat. The perfect place to go. But we are not escaping the heat, though, because we're out in the open and it's uh, burning down onto us. Luckily, for the wind, I can't believe I'm saying that. But it is cooling us down. We're surrounded by elephants at the moment. It's quite a big herd. They're all quite spread out. And they're just grazing, eating all the delicious things. Most of them don't seem to be feeding on grass. A couple, one or two are. But the bulk of them are picking up little forbs just from the ground that we can't see that they're just growing in there. This is so beautiful. And there's a couple of little babies also moving about the herd. Now, Jowie and I were just chatting about how many little ones we've been seeing. Typically, elephants don't have a breeding season. You know, it's such a long gestation period. Uh, it's difficult for the, uh, the females to sync their cycles. However... I wonder if that's what's going on because since September and even now in October we're starting to see a lot of little ones and it is a perfect time to give birth I mean I mean even now for Impala and things we see we obviously saw them they started um, I almost said they started hatching <laughs> but Impalas don't hatch out of anything <laughs> got birds on the mind today uh, but they were being dropped already two months ago when I first got here we we're just starting to see a couple of them it's interesting. I've never noticed anything in particular in South Africa. I've seen little elephants, tiny new ones, all year round. But definitely seeing a bulk of them around here at the moment. So we haven't had any luck just yet with our lions. We're still searching. No luck with a cheetah. We did have some lion tracks coming this way, but they looked heavily windblown from last night. So what I thought we would maybe do then is just change our route slightly. I know that the sausage tree pride, they aren't up against the escarpment. Then they're typically just south. South southeastish of the main road somewhere around there so we're gonna, we're gonna keep going and and hopefully we'll find them i wonder if they're just not on a kill somewhere i mean they, there's so many spots they could be up on their top rock oh that's beautiful we'll stop and have a look now it's gonna get a better fish is this wrong hello ellies why are you guys so nervous don't worry a couple of young bulls that don't seem to be particularly happy with me oh Let's see what they're going to do. You're going to come past or one bull and a cow? They're just going to walk in front of the vehicle. No? Oh, that's so funny. You should just call me James Henry from now on. Mm, it's always funny how James, every time he puts a camera on an animal, it then uses the luxury facility. So there's a tiny little elephant that's still having to stand on its tippy toes to suckle. 
very, very sweet, very precious. But there's elephants all over the Mara at the moment. It's quite spectacular. Thank you, Doki. Well, we're going to keep searching and uh, hopefully we're going to find one of our cats that we are looking for. Jamie, however, has not got a cat, but it has also got a beautiful pattern. A really beautiful pattern and the, the Maasai giraffe that we see out here have, I feel, probably one of the most spectacular of all of the giraffe species that occur in Africa. There's something so artistic about the, the patterning of the spots on their skin. Now he's dr or he was drinking. I'm hoping he's going to drink once again because for our new viewers, watching a giraffe drink is always a, it's a, well, it's a cumbersome process and watching it can be really thoroughly quite entertaining because they can't, of course, reach all the way down without having to spread their front legs so that they can get their head down to the level of the water. Now, there's a little puddle at his feet. Just trying to see if I can see what he's staring at. Now, there's a little puddle over there, and that's what he's been drinking from. <laughs> there it is. There's the puddle. Now, interesting thing about this particular species of giraffe, and it's really quite clear on this particular gentleman, is the protrusion that is between his eyes on the top of his head. So he's got ossicones. Watch now, he'll duck as we do this. He's got ossicones, of course, those are the horns on the top of his head, but you can also see there's a lump up between them. And that is the protrusion of his skull itself, that solid bone. And that's an additional fighting weapon for when he decides to challenge another male giraffe. And he's been so obliging, this gentleman. He's also, as Fergus pointed out, which I didn't notice, but he's also got a very interesting face. It's a very pale face with very few patches on it. And of course, each giraffe is unique in terms of their patterning. And he's very, very pretty. Long eyelashes, slightly, slightly wonky ossicone. But his face is really very pretty. Off he goes. Thank you, mister. He's been so obliging. He really has. He's been sitting here waiting for us. Umka, by the way, I double-checked in my other bird book and the male, ground, male crowned crane is slightly larger than the female. Sorry, just while I'm thinking about it. Um, Umka wants to know how much giraffe need to drink in a day. Giraffe are actually, they'll, they'll readily drink when there's water available, but they are, in terms of the animals that we see out here, they're one of the animals that is quite well adapted to surviving with quite low levels of water. So one of the big adaptions, of course, for, for desert-dwelling creatures, and, and you do find giraffe species in the desert, is their loop of henley in their kidneys is much, much longer proportionately than something like a human. So essentially where all of the water... As the kidneys filter the blood and as they, they sort of remove the, the toxins and the urea or whatever else it happens to be, as they filter the blood, there is a reabsorption process that happens in order to draw water back into, into the body so that it's not lost. And the longer the loop of Henley, the more water absorption can occur. So they've got quite long loops of Henley within their kidneys, within their the nephrons, yes, within the nephrons. So they can actually survive on minimal amounts of water. They are also very, very good at extracting the water from the leaves that they eat. As to exactly how much they drink per day, I don't know. I mean, when you watch a giraffe drink, it's not a process that goes on for a very long time. And it always seems to be actually quite low amounts of water that they consume. They drink a little bit and then they lift their heads up and then they take a couple more sips. It's not like sitting and watching an elephant, for example, that will drink liters and liters of water in one go and will repeatedly draw water up into their trunks and pour it into their mouths. There's all kinds of, I know Tristan's been talking about this and animals that cope best with the heat. There's all kinds of special things that animals can do in order to help to keep themselves cool. 
I think I've got exciting news for you, but I'm not going to share it yet because I'm still not 100% sure if my info is correct. So I'm going to go off and search for the creature that I've been told is about. Let's go across to Taylor, who has found a, an animal that really would not like to meet my surprise. I feel as though this is the only luck we're going to have today is with buffalo and elephants. We've come across a bizarre scene, uh, and we're just taking a step back and watching at the moment. There's a huge herd of buffalo. I mean, you can see they're streaming in. And when we first spotted them, just after you left us, they were crossing the road, all calm and collected. No, nothing nothing seemed out of the, the norm. And then the next minute, there was one cow that started running with her nose towards the sky as if she was about to chase a lion or a predator of sorts. And... She ran into the lugger and then she didn't come out. And then there were a whole lot of other buffalo that followed her also sort of running and, and bucking and bronking. They went, go, went into the lugger and then they would come around this sort of shrub where you can just sort of, you can just sort of see below, below those buffalo. And then they were looking around there and then they were running back into the lugger. I don't know what they're doing, but I'd quite like to go and investigate. So let's go a little bit closer now that they've settled. Obviously, when animals are in a bit of a frenzy, you don't want to go and drive right up into it. So we just sat back. I just wanted to see what was happening. Now we'll go in a little bit closer. I don't know if I've ever seen buffalo do this before. Now they're running again. They're very nervous about something. Now we know buffalo are constantly on edge. It's just buffalo being buffalo. But today something else is up. Unless they're laying in the mud. I, I can't imagine though that they would charge towards a lugger. Or maybe they were just excited for a mud wallow. I don't know, it's all very confusing. And they kept going to a shrub. I honestly thought that there was a, la a lion laying around here and they were going to chase it. It looked exactly like it. And then they were going around in circles and now they look fine again. Now they were f fairly relaxed. Well, as relaxed as a buffalo is going to get. So bizarre. See, now look, they're running off again. And then they stop and they turn. So with all the wind, what also could be happening is there could be scents of predators swirling in the, swirling in the wind look at them oh they go off they go again now kerry you're wondering what is a typically a huge herd of buffalo how many are there of them uh, okay well when i was in zambia the smallest herd of buffalo i saw was between eight about 800 buffalo or so and then the biggest herd i saw was about 2000 and it was quite common to see sort of between 800 and 2,000 buffalo together. In the Sabi Sand, we'd see huge herds of 1,000, you know, 500, 200 was a typically common size herd of buffalo down in the southern sands. And here I would say it's about the same. Anywhere between 100 to 150 is a, a decent size herd. And they can get much bigger. I mean, actually, look where that... Hang on. I'm going to get a better view here. Sorry, I'm, I'm just... We're just trying to get a view. I want to show you how many buffalo there actually are. We can't even see all of them. But if you look on the skyline, what we can do is if we start to the last buffalo that we can see on the left, and, and then we'll work our way back across to the right, you'll see how many there are. So you can just see their silhouettes, see the tops of their heads, their horns. And that line extends all the way to where we are at the moment. You still see them. And there's still more behind them as well, so they're still coming. I don't know how many are here, maybe three or four hundred buffalo? Maybe maybe I'm being a bit too generous, but there's plenty of them. But they've settled down again. I think it's got to do with the wind. Maybe, like I said, maybe they were smelling all sorts of things. Maybe a lion had moved through this area. I did have tracks coming past. Maybe they defecated somewhere, and it's that scent is swirling around, and that's panicked the animals slightly. So I don't think we'll go driving in amongst that herd. We'll probably just let them do their thing and settle down a little bit. We know uh, how uh, how much of a pain the wind can be to the animals, not to the predators. They want it. Uh, but, well, of course, it helps them hunt. But for something like a buffalo, they're not going to be able to smell as well, they're not going to be able to hear as well, and this becomes a problem. Uh, so naturally, they'll be a little bit more jumpy than they normally are. Calm again. Incredible how that behavior changed like that. It was bizarre. I hadn't quite seen anything like it. Hmm. Right, All right let's carry on though. Uh, Proud Cat Mama, you're wondering. No, we don't, let me get the car and go. You're wondering if lions, uh, not lions, we don't have lions, if buffalo sleep much. Uh, they, they do, they love a rest. 
And it's a buffalo's favorite thing to do. As soon as it hits 12 o'clock midday, they sit down in the shade of a tree and they ruminate or they wallow away. Uh, so uh, it's obviously a big risk for animals out here to sleep like say, uh, you and I would sleep, 8 to 10 hours. So uh, they can't do that because then they're not watching what's going on around them. It would be very easy for a predator to just sneak up and, and catch them. So they'll typically have sort of shorter rest periods and with buffalo, uh, you'll see them resting during the day normally and and then they'll rest sort of in the early hours of the morning most of the night it is spent grazing and some will sit down some will graze and they'll take turns right throughout the night but every time I've ever found a big herd of buffalo in the Sabi sand or even in in Zambia they're first at first light they're sitting down and then it's always nice to actually try and get in amongst the herd if they're relaxed enough and we could do that quite often in the Sabi sand they were very very relaxed the buffalo there especially obviously when you're in the car and foot is a different story and you could just park and then they'd all start waking up and go about which was really beautiful and with those big herds of buffalo you can imagine in the harsh dry winter months all the dust that's being kicked up at sunrise it's it's actually it's phenomenal it's also one of my favorite things i always tell you how i love spending time in and amongst buffalo herds but we're going to check this favorite road of the Sausage Street Pride. Also, there's a leopard around here that uh, has been seen before. Maybe we'll see that leopard. Tristan hasn't had much luck just yet, but I'm sure that's going to change. Well, I hope so, Taylor. I hope we will have some luck a little bit later. We have had lots of luck over the last little bit, so we can't complain at all. Today's been a bit on the quieter side, but it's okay. We've had, like I say, had such a great last couple months here on Juma that we can't really complain at all. We've seen so many interesting and crazy things that it's it's really been a special time and, and lots of kind of unusual stuff I mean we had the honey badger this morning I know we didn't get it on camera but we had a honey badger this morning we've had that cool track I was just thinking about it now that I'm on cheetah cut line of the wildcat dragging the scrub here which is really cool um, there's been all kinds of strange things the four cheetah you know so it's been a lot of interesting stuff over the last little bits and so even if we have a quiet afternoon well that's okay too it's always just nice to be out here and enjoy the bush and enjoy the kind of sunshine and the environment and, and all that that brings and this afternoon we've already had a couple of our migratory birds we've had in fact actually we had a cool thing that happened just now and I completely forgot about this but this was really cool so we just after we linked away to Taylor for the buffalo or the elephants I can't remember which one it was but it, as we went away from her we went around the corner in the Mulawati and a squirrel dashed in front of us and immediately it was evident that there was something in the squirrel's mouth and so VM and I were both looking and, and VM luckily got onto it very quickly and zoomed right in and he managed to get this picture of the squirrel carrying its tiny tiny little baby the baby was only about that big and it was carrying it and it was just sort of running along towards um, a big tree and then up into the tree it went but it was so cool to see I, I haven't seen a squirrel carrying its baby in many 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 years and so that was super special I wish we could have got it on camera but it's the way it goes so it's two really unusual things today that unfortunately we've just had bad timing with but super super interesting and like I say it's just amazing to see this little mother carrying this tiny squirrel and it was small 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 and it's just super cute as it kind of was huddled in its mom's mouth it was very cool so that's already something excellent to have this afternoon. Like I say, European beaters, cimitable on a kill, lots of things to already celebrate. So even if we have not much luck, you never know. But we are heading towards Chitwa Dam anyway, because I feel like going to Chitwa Dam today. I feel like spending a bit of time there by the water. And, and who knows, maybe Hosanna arrives or Tumba. One of them is in that area. We haven't spent much time in the afternoons at Chitwa for a while. And it's always a good spot when it's been quite warm. I find that the young boys tend to go there quite often and spend time in that area so who knows maybe we'll get a little lucky with a leopard around Chitra Dam it should be beautiful at the dam anyway it's a beautiful clear rich day and after that kind of cool weather I'm sure there's going to be a flurry of activity by the water so hoping to see a few birds down there I'm sure there'll be a couple of the cuckoos around I'm pretty sure that we'll see a number of swallows the village weavers might be quite active so lots will be going on and should be a good place to spend a bit of time this afternoon B. Wilson, I, I think I heard this correctly, but you're asking have the fish returned to the waterholes yet? So 
the thing is about fish and, and there's certain types of fish that are annual fish and so those fish grow every well basically hatch out of eggs that are dormant in the mud and then come out and those are called killifish we get one species of those they're beautiful bright blue color and red colors very very pretty very rare those you don't see them very often and then the other fish that you're referring to so things like bream um, or type of bream that we get here that we call tilapia Mozambique tilapia red-breasted tilapia are the two common ones in this area they will only really exist in the big water holes so Chitra Dam would most certainly be absolutely full of them um, big dam in the west um, some Amili dam that they have will have some in um, just trying to think where else maybe Buffelzook dam would might have a few there's a warthog over there um, and there might be a couple other dams in the area that will still have a few of those and then the catfish well the catfish are a special one because they can survive in very extreme conditions and you'll find that they'll were populated a number of the, the bigger water holes and as we get more rain they'll then start moving to the smaller ones that fill with water and so no not quite yet have the catfish moved into those smaller water holes you will find that will be later in the summer when they fill up a lot more than what they are now now it's still very dry you can see the surrounding grass and terrain is dry it's still quite wintry even though there's a bit of greenery on the trees and in the in the sort of base layer of the grass there's really not enough water yet for fish to be able to be washed into dams or to be able to walk there in the case of catfish now I know that sounds really odd but the catfish do walk so they use their fins and they'll walk away and that's because they can breathe air so they can be on land and they can actually cover quite a long distance the problem with that is obviously that number of predators then grab them as they go along so we will find a situation though that we will see some movement of fish in a little bit and if we get a flood year a lot of the fish go out of places like Chitwa Dam and will populate all of the riverbeds even. I remember after the 2012 floods behind Chitwa Dam wall in the, in the Maluanini drainage that it, as it goes towards um, towards Little Gauri, there was hundreds of red-breasted and Mozambique tilapia all the way through and even catfish as well all in the little pools and puddles that were left by that flood so it was very interesting. Right I'm gonna head to Chitwa Dam next time you see me I should be around the water areas and while I do that let's go back to Jamie Patterson in the Maasai Mara and I wonder if she's wearing her out of Africa hat this afternoon. Now here's some really very interesting behavior that drew our attention to these jackal. They were being chased by topi and they were being chased in particular by a female topi with a with a young calf. And I've never ever seen that before. Now they're being dive bombed. Oh, guinea fowl. Now they're being dive bombed by the lapwings of the area. Obviously really not a species that is particularly welcome around here. I've never ever seen a topi chase a jackal before. Is she gonna go? Is he going to go as well? No, I don't think he is. Quite. S <laughs> What's going on? Tommy making sure that they don't go anywhere near her little one. Obviously, jackal are largely scavengers and largely will eat uh, rotten carcasses or insects or berries those sorts of things but they are capable of hunting we saw a, a jackal with a freshly killed scrub hair not too long ago and a baby thompson's gazelle would also potentially make an easy meal for them which is why they are being treated with such weariness by the antelope you can see them being watched very very carefully but i've never seen a topi chase a jackal i wonder if they didn't go for the the just harass the the topi calf a little bit just to see if there was any sign of weakness from it and off they go i'm gonna go forward a little bit because there's very much bush in our way as you can see so that wasn't my surprise but i'm a bit concerned that my surprise might actually have vanished I'm not wearing my out of Africa hat and I, I have to tell you why I'm not wearing my out of Africa hat. Apparently the, the um, uh, um, Trista apparently made mention to it, apparently the, the sound was just so terrible because we wear our microphones in our hats and apparently it, the, the wind passing over the microphone was driving people crazy. So unfortunately, no, uh, until I can figure out a solution, the out of Africa hat has been put aside for the live safaris. What you up to, Yackles? Uh, 
I really think they're lurking about looking for baby Thompson's gazelles. And then Tommies are not very happy with them. And that one on the right is probably a mother. As you can see, she and that one as well. You can see some of the Thompsons are not really reacting as much as the others are. And there's a chance that there's young Tommies around here. Oh, Paula, you say don't jackals usually wait for dark to come out. They are active pretty much all the time. That jackal's found something. I don't know what it's chewing, but it's definitely found something. Um, jackals I've that I've seen, I've seen them active at pretty much every single time, every hour of the day or night, except really right in the hottest time of the day, in the middle of the day. But otherwise, I, I've seen jackals around and about all the time. So yes, they they, they do wander around and they probably cover greater differences at night but they are not strictly nocturnal shame little Tommy with your fluffy tail is she staring at the other jackal or is she staring it's hard to tell now this distance there's something quite odd about this whole scenario. I think these jackal were hunting. I really do. Now what's it after? Proud cat mama, small rodents, small things like scrub hairs and tiny antelope. Baby antelope, a Thompson's gazelle would be on the menu of two jackal. A baby impala, there are recorded cases, I've never seen it, but there are recorded cases of family groups of jackal actively hunting baby impala as well. So anything that is small enough for them to take on. And their behavior here is almost like they're pushing for a weakness or potentially, now we've seen that when we were driving would be a good example, although I've seen it with Imani as well, the cheetah. And we've seen just how still and quiet little baby Thompsons can be. Oh, Jackal, you are not popular. Lapwings, gazelle, everything wants to chase you. And we've seen how still and silent they sit until right up until the last moment. And there was that tiny baby Thompsons gazelle in the middle of the road a couple of days ago. And I think there is a... They, I think, first of all, they're eating... They could be eating eggs, although... The lapwings, I think, would be going even even crazier at this point, if that were the case. But they might be looking for a little Tommy hiding in the grass. There's definitely something that's keeping them here. Stalking and lurking. Hmm... I think I'm going to go around. If if they are if they, if that is what they're doing, then they'll still be here, and we won't be quite so far away. It might just take me a little while to get back onto the main road, and then we'll be able to get a little bit closer and hopefully figure out exactly what's happening. We zoom around. Let's send you over to Tristan, who is making his way to one of the more beautiful spots in the Slavi Sand. Whoops. Well, we are, but we've come here and we were busy setting up to look at the hippos and the impalas have all just started snorting behind the damn wall. So everybody looks on edge, everybody looks very skittish. There's a couple of water buck that are here that are also looking a bit nervous. So we're just having a check. You can hear every now and then a little snort around us. Now, I'm not sure they've seen anything, but everybody seems to be fairly kind of confused. And it's not the typical kind of snort where you hear when you get something like a rutting impala, it's a bit different to that. Now I don't know, they've all kind of quietened down, they're, they're almost looking down into this drainage line, so I want to just come and check. I have seen leopard in here before, so I might just come and have a little 
quick squiz and quick check just to see if there isn't maybe something lurking in this dip. It's a good place for a leopard to be. Also I'm trying to spot around just checking under all the shady spots. You can see how quickly the impalas are leaving this area that maybe just maybe they've spotted something around here. It's worth checking and worth kind of just having a double look now. I wonder if our aerial is going to be okay through here. How are we going to do there? We're going to be all right for him. There we go. So we've just gotten through by the skin of our teeth. Oh, I wonder why they were all shouting. I can't see anything. So typically if they shout like that, it's when they've spotted something and they've seen a predator. But I don't see any sign of anything. I'm looking around as much as I can. Just checking in the shady sections. Maybe there's a leopard that's lying low. Maybe there we go. There's a leopard. Tumba. We've got Tumba. Yes. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> so I haven't seen him the whole time I've been back at work. And there we go. We've managed to find him. And I said there might be a leopard behind the dam wall. I was convinced that we might find one in this heat and there we go how cool is that so he's lying in a bit of a horrible spot it's not great for viewing but it's still a leopard in the shade and it certainly makes my day when I find spots and the other interesting thing is his belly is full 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 so he's got a nice big round tummy which means that he's obviously had a meal at some point so that's really cool I'm glad we managed to come down to Chitwa that was a good stroke of luck wasn't it well done Viem as well Viem's looking out and he heard the impala snort first before me so there we go it takes a bit of a team to be able to spot these things how cool is that i love finding leopards it's the best thing in the world hello boy so sorry megan if you can just repeat that for me my earpiece just pulled out So our beard, you say bingo, exactly. Bingo is the exact right word for this. This is so cool. I'm so glad we managed to find him. And luckily he's also lying in, uh, I mean, it's not the greatest place for sure. And, and we could have better areas, but he's lying in a place that at least we can find him and we can see him. And hopefully at some point on the afternoon, we'll spend some time here. There's lots of impalas, lots of water buck, lots going on. We can spend a bit of time and we can eventually then try and kind of see him maybe coming out. I'm hoping he's gonna head towards the dam wall a little bit later because that'll be absolutely beautiful if he does. But I'm super, super happy to see him. It, he's getting big as well. He's looking quite bulky. I suppose he's got a full tummy, so that's why. But it looks like him. I, I'm so excited that it's definitely not Hassan. I know that, but it does look like our boy Tumba. So this is where he's obviously been hanging about, is in this particular section. Hopefully he turns so I can just double check. Like I say, I might just be jumping the gun slightly, but it looks like him. Big enough pause, that's for sure. But isn't that beautiful? Now I wonder where the meal's been that they've been feeding on because he's definitely got a meal somewhere because that belly is massive. So he's fed somewhere, maybe even in this particular section. And so it might be our carcass hidden in this drainage. We once saw Hosanna here playing with the scrub here. It's exactly the same place where we had Hosanna. And so maybe, just maybe, he's got a kill also hidden in this deep gully. It's a great place for a leopard to hide a carcass and to hide a meal. And so that could be where he is, sort of hiding it in somewhere in this little thicket. And he might have just gone for water and now he's come in. And the reason why these impalas saw him is not because of actually him being out and invisible is that they've got a lot of height so a number of the impalas are standing on top of the dam wall and that means they can actually see into this drainage and down and that's why they were managing to spot him but now they're not so sure they can't really see him so he's actually in a good place for hunting a little bit later if some of the impalas stream past here again maybe just maybe he might get lucky and hunt again although with the belly like that I'm not sure there's going to be too much hunting going on by our young lad at all but so good to see him. I'm so glad we've managed to kind of find where he is. And this is great news because if he's here, it means he's been spending a bit of time in this area. And so now we know where he is. Tumba seems to be a character that spends a lot of time in the same place and doesn't seem to move around a lot. And so if we know where he is, it's a good place to check and to keep moving around and to keep coming and back to. And eventually, you know, we'll pick him up I reckon quite a lot in behind this Chitwa Dam wall area. It's a great place for leopards. I've always had a lot of luck in this section and always kind of have had 
great leopard sightings behind this dam wall. It's shady, it's thick, there's a lot of gullies and drainages which is great for hunting. So it is the perfect place if you are a leopard to spend time. But look at how beautiful those eyes are. It's most definitely Tumba and I believe a lot of you agree that it is him. It's just now that I can see his face a little bit better it is him. When I first spotted him he just glanced over at us and those eyes just looked like him and so that's why I got a bit excited by all of it and I didn't actually make sure. Kerry, you're asking, you wonder if he'll hunt tonight if he's that full. Well, Tumba is an interesting character, is that he always seems to be up to something. And so even with a full belly, I'd imagine he's going to be quite explorative and try and kind of move around, explore a tree, shall he, should I say? I don't know where that other word came from. But he might move around, and if he gets an opportunity like Impala's coming towards him, he'll most certainly take it. He's an opportunistic animal, he's a young male, he's finding his feet, and so any chance to hunt, he will take. Even if he's full like this, it's also just the curiosity and the, and the youthful exuberance exuberance in him that will make him kind of go after certain animals even with a full tummy like that. So I don't know if he will be too full of hunting but he'll definitely want probably water. You can see he's panting quite heavily. It's a hot afternoon. So regardless of what happens I'm pretty sure he's going to move at some point and either go and drink maybe towards the dam which would be ideal or he might go behind us here in this drainage section. There's a beautiful little water point inside there that's very reclusive and very kind of hidden and it's a great place for a leopard to go and have a spot of water so he might head in those directions we'll just have to see but what I think I'm going to do is just quickly reposition us because VM's got not much to work with the back of his head and if I reverse back I remember being here with Sebastian and we actually found a way to view Hosanna in a similar place when we just reversed a little bit and went into this clearing here so VM you're gonna to have to tell me if you can see you won't see much just yet but hold on so it just goes to show you this deep gully, I mean, if from where I am right now, which is pretty much on top of Tumba at the moment, I can't see him at all. I don't have any view of him. I can't see any sort of sign of him. He's right below us, but it is why he likes to spend time in a place like this. Hello, boy. Look at those big eyes just looking up at us. How's that, Viram? Can you see him? Yeah, is that better? It's a weird view to be looking down on a leopard. It's not very often that you look down as steep as this onto a leopard itself, but he has the most beautiful eyes. Hello. What you been up to? Where have you been? Far too long that we haven't seen him. Oh, he's a beautiful cat though. He is going to be a seriously stunning individual when he's older in life. He really is got one of the most captivating markings on a leopard that they dark and black and rich around his face, those light greenish eyes. You can see his ears are still in perfect condition and he's got his mom's coat. He's got that darker kind of orangey gold coat, much darker than what we see from Hasana. So he's a really good looking individual and one that I'm sure is going to captivate many in his life. Now I'm going to sit and spend my afternoon with Tumbo because this was our kind of goal was to try and find a leopard this afternoon and I found my favorite individual so I'm gonna spend as long as I can with him and hopefully we'll have an epic afternoon and he'll move around but while we do that Jamie has got something that is already on the move. Well everything's nervousness is really quite quickly explained now that we've found the lioness that has been wandering about so I think that the, jack the jackal just kind of fell foul of the the jumpiness that the lioness's presence invoked Oh, we're gonna. Cheers, guys. She's looking absolutely glorious in the late afternoon sun. So, the surprise that I was talking about was, in fact, Scar, who apparently is not far away from here at all. So, what we're gonna do is we're going to probably follow this lioness for a little bit because she's been with him, she's been mating with him. And then we will come back and see if we can find scars. It starts to get a bit dark. Because, of course, as evening falls, there's a good chance that he's going to be roaring. After a few days of mating, uh, there will be two, th two things on this lioness's mind. The first will be to reunite with her pride. The second will be to try and find some food. So generally, mating pairs will not feed while they are mating and the female's estrous cycle lasts for a few days. So as a result, both of them tend to be quite hungry after they separate. Now, apparently she was mating with a young male 
and then Scar sent him packing sometime last night and took over the whole process. I assume probably one of the young males with the collar, or the one with the collar, but I don't know. I'm not 100% certain. It's just the right area for that to be the case. Now, she's most definitely on a mission, but I don't think that mission is hunting. I think that mission is food. <laughs> Idiot. That's what, I'm, that's what I meant to say. <laughs> yeah, shopping. Um, I think her mission is to reunite with her pride. Uh, whenever we've seen lionesses mating, when the pride is around, you can actually see their desperation to try and get back to the rest of the pride. I don't know which, lion, which lioness this is. I don't know which pride she belongs to. I'm going to say that judging by the direction that she's walking in, she could either be an Egyptian goose. She's, that's the pride name. That's not, not an animal. She's definitely not a goose. Or she could be Magoro, or she could be Paradise. Quick phlegm and grimace. She's obviously smelled something nice there. But the way that she's walking out in the open like this, I don't think she's after anything. Theodore, it's actually quite difficult to tell <clears throat> when the lioness is in front of the antelope because the shot becomes compressed. So it, um, she looks closer than she is. I think she's probably, I can't even see her anymore. I think she was probably around about mm, 70 odd meters away. Let's go, let's reposition because there are some baby topi up ahead and baby antelope tend to make mistakes in situations like this when they panic. She might decide to go for one. I don't think she will, though. No, she was more than that. She was about 100 meters. Yeah, she was about 100 meters from that antelope. 100 yards, give or take. And as, when an antelope can see a lion, they're comfortable. If they, I mean, they're not, they're not thrilled with the situation, but they are certainly more comfortable than they would be if they could simply smell a lion or and not see it because it's not really the lion that they see that's going to catch them. Natalie about all animals out here actually uh, so Natalie's question is if a, if a lion is is very pregnant will it affect her hunting ability and the answer is not really that's why the cubs are born as altricial as they are as tiny as they are or one of the reasons why quite simply because it means that she can continue with her oh topi fight Toby, Toby, don't fight while the lioness is walking. Sorry, the to the, she's straight ahead and the Topi fight happened right in front of the vehicle. Ah, oh, run, they've, they've run off now. There's some little ones. And some panicky mothers. So, it won't really affect the lioness's ability to hunt. She might be a little bit slower than normal. She might have slightly less stamina than she would otherwise have. It very much depends upon just how, just how far along in the pregnancy she is. And it's, with big cats, you actually only really notice the pregnancy right towards the end. Um, as the lioness is getting ready to, to or reach his full term. Antelope as well. I always find it amazing that antelope are able to run away in the way that they are. Oh, little dashing. <laughs> dashing dopey ah oh, it's all happening as evening descends here in the mara there's not just myself with animals doing interesting things let's go across to taylor who's got two ha hippos who don't seem to be too happy with each other they are indeed a it's something that we all absolutely love to watch and we typically sit at Chitwa Dam for most of the afternoon and watch hippos play around and that's what we've got but not in South Africa. 
in Kenya in the Mara River. It actually sounds like we're at the beach. The river is raging so much at the moment over the rocks. And these two youngsters are having the absolute time of their lives. Now, this is not a proper fight. It's just practicing and pro find it's two young bulls. Oh, there's another one opening up and displaying. And they always do this at sunset. Well, just as the sun is about to go down, they've been resting for most of the day, not doing anything, enjoying the rapids, peace and quiet, I'm sure. Maybe the odd cocktail in hand, who knows? And now they're getting ready to leave the water. And then there's even, there's some youngsters who have just joined in just to the left, just sitting quite close to mom. They've also just started pushing each other around and opening their mouths. There's, that looked like mom that was doing that. And the other one's just submerged itself now. They looked a little bit younger than the ones we were just watching. So not an uncommon thing to see, and probably the most interesting. I always feel sad for guests when they come on safari, and all they say is that we want to see hippos opening up their mouths. And, and funny enough, if you don't time it correctly during the day, you'll end up just seeing them sleeping on the banks of the river. And you can sit with them for 10 minutes, and then you've pretty much seen it all. So first thing in the morning, and just as the sun is setting, it's the most exciting. And then, of course, to be able to see them out of the water at night, too, is pretty spectacular. Great to see how large they really are. There will also be a lot of interaction, though, within uh, this particular pod. You'll find that they'll greet one another as well. well they've all been laying up on top of each other. And now they're going to play. Must be um must be full of energy though if you think about it if you've just been sleeping the whole day ready and rearing to go isn't this awesome oh wow look at that look 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 with a big male he just porpoised that was incredible if he does it again so, and then that also just did a bit of a call he leapt out of the water which is incredible because when when you see hippos you think they're not athletic they can't do anything but they really can jump quite high out of the water and splash about when they want to now francis all the way from israel you're wanting to know if uh, hippos always come out of the water at night they do indeed uh, they have to uh, unless there's grass growing right on the edge of the river which they can munch on sometimes there is but it's not necessarily the most palatable grass with the highest nutrients so they have to travel further distances to find suitable for grazing and I feel as though there's no shortage of grass though in the Mara I don't think there's ever a shortage of grass look at this guy here hello actually looks like a female she must have just been resting up on the bank down below us and something gave her a bit of a fright. She came charging out. So you saw that again. And that wasn't even her at full speed. Looks like a young male on the left. So there's clearly one dominant bull amongst this pod. And then there seem to be quite a few young males within this group as well but they'll just sit very quietly and they're the ones that will be pushing and shoving each other isn't, the river is incredible the way that it's sound it really reminds me of being at the beach being at the ocean i close my eyes it doesn't smell like the ocean to me some of the guides say it does i don't think so but i just think of the waves and waking up early and going swimming not that you'll find me doing that often at the ocean, petrified of sharks, even though I know there's no chance of me probably being struck by lightning than eaten by a shark, but I'm still scared, nonetheless. They haven't stopped, have they? All just having a great afternoon. And the light is just starting to change now, too. There's a couple of clouds in the west, which is not unusual for the Mara, um, but the sun seems to just be catching, and just, just peeping through those gaps now. Okay, right, who's gonna, who is going to wake up next? I'm <laughs> Every time we go away, they pop us out of the water. One just leaped out of the water now. 
And uh, now, Paula, you're wondering how old is a hippo when it leaves its mum? Uh, typically, you'll see mum with an older offspring and, and a young and a youngster. So, um, I would say at about two years old, you'll find that they'll they'll start moving away and doing their own thing, hanging around mum but not relying on her 100%. Uh, and oh well, two two to about three years old when she has her new calf, and then after that period, at about four five. I think, I think females have become sexually mature around four or five years old, and a bull will typically only start mating maybe about eight, seven, eight years old, somewhere around there. So it takes them a bit of a, a, a bit of a, a while to mature. And it's not that they can't mate; it's you'll just find that they're just not big and strong enough to be able to go in and take on a territorial bull. But a very nice scene here. Now I've come down to the Mara River because David told me this morning that there were lions around this area. So I'm looking for the Paradise Pride, but we might have to go a little bit further south to be able to find something. So I think that's exactly what we're going to do. Oh, but hang on, before that, look here. Look at the giraffe and the golden light. They're also coming down now. That is spectacular. Just because I was telling you about the beautiful golden light that's just dawned on us. Okay, well, we'll keep traveling along the Mara River and hopefully if we find those lions. Tristan, however, is not sitting with a lion, but he's sitting with one of the most gorgeous young leopards I have ever laid eyes on. Well, he is indeed, he's probably, well, for me, I suppose, one of the most beautiful leopards that I've also spent time around. He's a really good-looking fellow, but you can also see he's a rather hot and tired fellow, too, so he's having a bit of a snooze now. There are a couple of cars that will be coming to join us just now, so maybe that might prompt him into waking up out of his slumber, but I think we're going to see this for a while. It's still quite steamy out here and quite warm, and so... He's in a perfect place with a bit of shade. I would imagine that that soil down there is quite cool because it's been in shade most of the day. And so he can have a really nice rest here before then going and getting water a little bit later towards the sort of sunset time. So it's going to be a patience game for us. We're going to have to just sit here and wait with him for a while and then eventually he should get up and maybe move around. Riti, I, no, I don't think Tumba is marking territory just yet. I mean, if we're not seeing it from Osana, and, and we certainly, I don't think, we'll be seeing it from Tumba for quite some time. Remember that he is six months younger than Hosana, and at the moment, you know, Tingana is being quite polite to the two boys, and he's allowing them both to spend time here, even though they are no longer with their mothers. And so marking territory is a surefire way to get yourself booted away from the area and get yourself a bit of a hiding from Dad. And so it's better just to take stay nice and chilled and, and, and relaxed and under the radar bulk up get bigger and then only start trying to compete a little bit later in life and so for a while he's going to be i think still not scent marking he'll only probably do it much later in life the interesting thing though is while we talk about scent marking and young males and kind of competition and how that all works i believe quarantine and tingana are having a big spat at, as we speak not too far from us at they're on in Coral at the moment and Tingana had a kill there and quarantine sounds like is trying to steal it from Tingana which is a turn up for the books and it's gonna be interesting to see how that plays out and who then gets pushed where because at the end of the day quarantine is also bulked up a lot he's quite a big guy and, and he's at the end of the day finding Tingana in his territory that's an area that quarantine actively is patrolling and so I'm gonna be very interested to see how this plays out during the course of the afternoon it's obviously blow by blow updates on the radio so I'll be able to kind of keep us up to date as we go through the drive but for the meantime we're going to concentrate on Tamba you can see he's pretty much straight below us and and yet he's still completely comfortable you would think that a leopard would be a little bit more nervy of this big vehicle and voices straight above him but you can see he is not at all worried by us. He's having a really good nap. Every now and then his eye opens. There's a little robber fly that is flying around there. And so he's having a thing where he kind of wakes up as the robber fly kind of comes through. Now, Paula, in terms of leopards sharing territory, no, not really. So you'll have a situation where you'll have overlapping territories to a degree in, in terms of the females. Sometimes they'll kind of overlap a little bit. If we look at a case in point is somebody like Tandi and Kuchava or Tandi and Shadow, they busy overlapping a little bit. We're seeing Shadow and Tandi in the same places and the same thing with Kuchava and Tandi, you know, they're overlapping around Chitwa and, and Torchwood area. But at the end of the day, not really. They don't really want to overlap with anybody else. They want to share a territory. And in males, 
in, under no circumstance do they want to share with other males because any other male is mating competition. It is dangerous for their offspring and it, at the end of the day is also utilizing their food and water. And so males tend to be a lot more upset about a female, I mean another male being in their territory than females. Females tend to overlap a little bit more than what we see with the males. Although in saying that this northern Sabi Sands area and in fact the Sabi Sands in general is a really interesting dynamic on leopard because the density is so high it means that you've got a situation where a number of males are overlapping with one another. They are finding a lot of competition in the area and ultimately they're trying to extend their territories as much as possible but still bumping into each other so if you think about just this northern sector just male leopards in a sort of 10,000 hectare block which is 20,000 acres it's very small if you think that the leopards in the Kalahari area some of those leopards will have almost 200,000 acres as a territory, a single male leopard. Now, you come into this area and in that 10,000 hectares or 20,000 acres, you have Tamba, Hosana, Gajima, um, this unknown male in Buffel's Hook, you've got Mvula, Tingana, Quarantine, Anderson, and so there is a lot, a lot of young males that are around, or males in general around. There's also Shavambalan on the, on the outskirts, if you think about that too. So there's a number of youngsters and, and, and older leopards, and they're all sharing a very small area. So you're having a situation where it's quite tough for these guys, and it's going to be interesting to see how the dynamics play out. Uh, what, what has really surprised me is that Anderson has not pushed any further than saying earlier if a car arrives we might see him just put his head up and have a little look around and see what's going on so he's just a curious cat he always has been I see he's got a little nick on his nose so he's obviously had a little scrap with somebody and got a little sort of cut on his nose there which is to be expected of a male leopard is perfect kind of coat is slowly but surely starting to get little scratches and marks which is pretty much par for the course and you'll get a number of those as life goes on. I wonder if maybe that wasn't from the multitude of multiple leopard sightings that he's been seen in. So he's been seen around Hosana, he's been seen around Tandi obviously, his mom, he's been seen around Tingana, he's been seen around Kuchava and so he's got a number of kind of different leopards that he spent time around and I wouldn't be surprised one of them just swatted a little bit at him and gave him a little cut on his nose. It's not bad though, it's just superficial and he'll be absolutely fine. So he's going to be But look at those eyes, isn't he beautiful? And you can see he's just watching the new people that arrived. Of course he's got to inspect everybody and make sure that he analyzes everyone so that they're not in any way a problem. Right, now while we kind of watch Tumba gazing around and checking out his environment, oh, and he's up and moving, so maybe he's going to walk towards the water hole. But while he's moving, I believe Jamie's lines are also on the move, so let's go across to her. Amazing thing, I've never seen this before. Our lioness has just picked up an ostrich egg off the ground. Now, typically the nests are guarded, so there's a good chance that this is actually uh, an abandoned ostrich egg or one that was never destined to make it. But still, this is really quite incredible. She's wandering off with her mouth. She looks like a Labrador with about five tennis balls. Her mouth is so stuffed full of ostrich egg. This is really cool. You don't often get to see this. Uh, if it, I, I would suspect that if this, if this ostrich egg came from an active nest, you would see either the male or the female around, and they'd be very distressed and very upset, and I don't see any sign of that. So that's even better, because it means we're getting to enjoy the sighting without the fact that a, an, an ostrich has lost its egg. I think that egg was lost already. Let's catch up with her, because I want to be there when she breaks it. Ostrich eggs are really hard. Obviously, <laughs> and water is wet. No, what I mean by that is the shell is hard enough to support the weight of a human standing on it. I stood on one when I was a child because I didn't believe the guy when he told it to me. And it does. Ah, oh, she's gonna go into this rocky area. I can just sense it. I do want to see where she goes though. And I really want to see when she cracks the egg. We must make sure as soon as she stops, we've got our ambient mic right up. Paula, you say breakfast for dinner. Best kind of dinner. Everybody loves breakfast for dinner. Actually, I could do with that tonight. An egg. Stop quickly, but we're in really big trouble now. Really big trouble. 
Jamie has taken the worst possible route into a rocky outcrop. So we're just going to look at her quickly and then I'm going to have to go around somehow. Okay. Okay, let's go. How am I going to do this? I think I'm going to have to go around that way. Whoops. Hmm? Ah, yes, there we go. Ferg has found a way. I was going to go around the other way, but I think Ferg's way is infinitely better. Hold on, though, because the rocks might be hidden in the grass. Looks clear. There's a rock. There's a rock. Wait, Linus, wait. Don't eat your breakfast without me. Can't go too fast or I'll smash a diff on the rocks. Oh, here's some major big rocks. Just hold on. This is gonna be fun. Hold on, everybody. Hold on, everybody. I'm gonna hit the my tow bar is gonna hit it. Oh, yeah, there it is. Oh, there it is. Uh oh. Thanks, Vix. <laughs> sure, you say all the lioness needs is a warthog, but she can have bacon and eggs. Sorry, Keto. Absolutely. There we go. Yes, thanks, Ferg. That was almost a disaster as I planted our diff lock on, the, on a rock. Where is she? Oh, there she is. Oh, no, she's dropped her egg. Oh, I wonder if it was rotten. Did that with it? Got you. Oh, I see, I see. I'm going to go past this car and then we can stop. coming she'll come it'll be worth it I can't believe you left your egg why'd you leave your eggy oh no you gonna come right across in front of us oh, hold on beautiful what we're aiming for is her walking straight in front of the Sun being watched by a pair of Buffalo actually as well Nice. So pretty. I wonder why she didn't eat that egg. It obviously wasn't very good. Because she definitely didn't eat it in the time that we, that we spent with her. Or, or weren't spending with her, that is. Here she go, goes golden. Out here in the Mara, it's not just every cloud that has a silver lining. The lions have them as well. I know you, lioness. Of course, evening, no matter where you are, whether you are in South Africa or in the Maasai Mara, is always gorgeous. And nothing looks more beautiful than a big cat in golden light. Indeed, Jamie. And Tumba's putting on a real show. He's starting to walk around nicely in this, this golden afternoon sunshine that's coming through. And he can't really make up his mind as to where he wants to go. He's gone kind of up and down and round and back. And then now we're slowly kind of 
settling down again it almost looks like he's stopped and is just watching and hopefully he is going to come out and up towards the dam wall side because the light on the dam wall is absolutely perfect and it should be wonderful if he heads that way we should be in for an absolute treat if he does but isn't he just the most beautiful cat and he really is quite full as well he's struggling a little bit with this story and having to kind of deal with this big belly on a hot day seems as though he's watching something now there were some water buck that were around and you can see he's gotten quite low now it's almost like he's into a sort of stalk mode so he's kind of got his head down and just watching trying to keep his profile as low as possible and trying to just stay out of view but it looks like he's going to settle down maybe there and lie down again oh. There we go. It just took a while to figure out exactly where we wanted to lie. So not onto the dam wall just yet. Maybe he's worked out still a little on the warm side to be heading down there and to be kind of getting into a position where he's in the sun. So we might just have to wait a little bit longer. But at least he's moved out of that very steep drainage. It makes it a lot easier for us, that's for sure, to, to view him. And we don't feel as though we're right on top of him, which is a lot more comfortable for, I think, everybody involved. But you can see definitely panting a bit and he hasn't really exerted much energy he just took a short stroll but he's built up quite a bit of heat and also that food is pushing up on the lungs so much shorter breath sky doogie is wondering if he gets an occasional meal from mom well sky doogie i don't think so i think unfortunately for him no meals from mom anymore i think he's in a situation where he's all on his own these days he's going to have to fend for himself the fact that she's pregnant um, is going to mean that she's not going to be feeding him i don't think she's going to be trying to find food for him anymore i think that relationship unfortunately has now been severed and he's now going to live life as a loaning male now you can see he's walking right past the car he doesn't really care too much i'm going to roll forward so that we can get a better view of him and i don't have to kind of look at the cars and so we just don't even have to turn the vehicle on it's the nice part about being on a very steep slope is that i can just roll a little bit now hopefully he settles somewhere there because it's going to be beautiful up there and that late afternoon light is absolutely wonderful so maybe what i'll try and do now well hopefully these guys are not going to block me which they're not so that's pretty good there's unfortunately a really nice big marsh here and so i can't really cross that because otherwise i'm going to have a situation where i might get stuck but what i want to do try is what i would like to try is to go from this side over here and just see if we can't get a better view from a little lower down it's going to be a bit bumpy sorry vildi a little on the bumpy side and a little bit on the mushy muddy side too but let's see we might be able to no, is he moving again? Can you see better, Vildi, or no? I don't have visual. No, I think he's moving again. So I was hoping that we'd be able to see from here, but it seems as though he's gone down. Sorry, Liam. Got to cover you in a bit of mud, as Taylor said. You're not a guide unless you're in a bit of mud. So we're going to try and just. There we go. That's better. There his head is and so if I just go up here we should get a better view and so while I reposition myself and while I work out how I'm going to go and do all of this I believe Taylor McCurdy has also got a incredibly beautiful view of the afternoon sunset and so hopefully it will be very pretty. Right we've been well most afternoons we've had so far have been very very clouded days and I mentioned to you that we had a little break, a little gap in the clouds, and it has allowed for us to show you the most magnificent sunset, though it's gone down exceptionally quickly. About, feels like it was about 10 seconds ago, you could see the entire sun. Now it's just dropping down below the horizon. So I challenge everyone today, Jamie, Tristan, to show off your best sunset view. And I hope you got some screenshots, share them with all of us and tell us which one was your favorite. You can do that by hashtagging a safari live. So before we went across, before we went across to the river, no, car please work. Whew. Car's been giving me some serious hassles today. I think it's about to die, but anyway, we'll make it through. Um, so let me try this a third time. Before we went down to the river, I did see some cars gathering just off to the right of where we're going now and I think that it could have been a, ma a young male and a female lion that we saw mating a couple of afternoons ago I wonder if they just haven't been hanging around the same area so we're gonna go and have a look and see if we can find them um, 
hope I just hope now that I haven't left it too late. I also cannot see now from the sun. Everything is just I'm just gonna have to keep one eye open on the road. So it'd be difficult spotting animals. Jackals are just starting to wake up too. We'll see if we can show you the jackals in a minute. Just gonna have a quick look around. There's an abundance of game though. Lots of topi, lots of Thompson's gazelles, plenty buffalo about too, and a few impala. So if there aren't big cats here, they could have just been looking at something else too. Uh, it might be worthwhile that we actually just sit here for a little bit and see if they get up to something. Okay, so it looked like it was down around this tree up ahead. I'm just going to keep an eye on because I don't know which side of the road they were looking. If they were looking to the left hand side or they are looking to the right. And this is pockets of really, really long grass which does make it difficult to see anything. Just check here. We're getting to that point now as well where the light becomes really deceiving. I haven't seen anything yet. Oh, I wonder where they are. Okay, well, we keep searching around here and hopefully we will find some lions or a leopard or who knows what we're gonna find in this long grass. Jamie, however, is all set up for her sunset shot. I have indeed, Taylor. We've heard about your challenge and we've decided to present you with this as our submission. A buffalo's backside, yes, I know. Well, it was it was a lot more dramatic when its head was up, admittedly. Um, now, if I were a cheat, I would tap the side of the car, but I'm not a cheat, and that would... Oh, oh. <laughs> Thanks, buffalo. Thanks a lot. So there we go, that's the submission of our sunset shot. Those of you who are really quick might have caught it as it was standing up. Now we've got now we've got silhouettes of ears. Fine. Fine, I'll just move on, shall I? <laughs> ooh, 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 nice Ferg. Glowy buffalo. Oh. Not Chloe. <laughs> not, not, not Chloe, Glowy. Glowy, Glowy, Chloe. <laughs> Chloe, Chloe the buffalo bull. I'm very sorry if we have any viewers out there named Chloe that was <laughs> Jared in final control back on Juma. He says that it looks as though the grass is on fire. It does, doesn't it? Another spectacular Mara sunset. Not that we've had... We haven't had many average sunsets, let's be honest. We've been presented with some really special ones recently. It was a lot more special when you were standing up, Mr. Buffalo. I feel as though you're on Taylor's side in this. You sabotaged me. Tisk. I was about to say let's let's enjoy the silence for a little bit and then I, I realized there are two vehicles that are about to come rushing past. So let's not do that. Okay, okay. While these cars go past us and our buffalo slumber on, let us head back to South Africa so that, of course, Tristan can also have a chance to participate. Well, here is my submission to the sunset competition. And that's actually a rhyme, I didn't even know about that. But anyway, we got a tumble. It's still a little early for our sunset, but we'll put it in anyway because the girls are pushing and they're saying they want it. But there is our sun slowly setting behind a leopard and well I, I like red sunsets and I like clouds in sunsets there is very few things in this world that is better than a leopard with a sun setting behind it and so VM reckons that ours wins hands down he says it's not even a competition and I tend to agree with VM it is absolutely beautiful and that sort of little gold rim that is kind of highlighting Tumba and his whiskers and his ears and his sort of body is just absolutely perfect so such a special way to see a leopard and the more that sun is coming down the better it's going to get and the more sort of colors we're going to see and the more it's just going to probably blow our minds away so I'm super happy that we are in the position we're in and hopefully he stays exactly where he is <laughs> 
So Lily, who's three years old, hello Lily, and I hope you're having a wonderful day. And you say, oh, hello Tumba. So you are obviously familiar with our leopards, and do you think, Lily, I want to ask you actually, we're going to get your expert opinion, and I want to know what you think about Tumba. If you give me one word to describe Tumba, everybody else can compete and partake in our little one word tweet for Tumba, but I want to know, Lily, what you think about Tumba. Do you think he's pretty? Do you like him? What do you think? And so you can let me know on hashtag Safari live how you feel about Tumba and what seeing him makes you feel okay so that's what I want to see but he is a beautiful cat and I'm super happy that we get to spend time with him he's just the most wonderful individual he's become so much more relaxed I remember when he was a cub he was a nightmare to keep up with he used to run around all over the place now look at that he's posing in the golden sunshine and it doesn't really get much better than that if you think about seeing leopards and seeing cats in general big cats out in Africa being eye level with the Sun setting behind is one of those things that I think everybody has on their bucket list well everybody that's watching this show more than likely has on their bucket list at some point so we're being absolutely spoiled by Tumba and those eyes as well he's just got the most magnificent eyes and you know after seeing Mvula the other day they're so similar in terms of their eyes and their looks and he's got the same kind of shape head as Mvula big ears and those lighter kind of eyes. Mvulas are a lot more blue tinged than what Tumbas are. Tumbas take on a lot more green, but still very similar in the way that they look. But isn't that just so beautiful? He's watching a few water buck. That's what he's busy staring at over on the top of the dam wall towards the lodge. There's also our Egyptian goose that is flying around. And so I think he's just loving the fact that he can sit right out in the open. There's a bit of a breeze blowing. You can see the grass just moving slightly and there's shade as well. So it's just a perfect place for a young leopard to spend time. Well, I think so anyway. He's absolutely wonderful. So, take care. You're asking when a leopard scent marks. Now, I think you said that do they can they tell how long it was ago or how much time has passed is that right Megan did I get that right or did I miss it oh. so I would imagine so yes I would imagine that they are sensitive enough to know that there is a fresh scent or a not so fresh scent I think they'd also be sensitive enough if they sensitive enough to know that it's a male female if she's in estrus if it's young male or dominant male if they sensitive enough to that they'll be definitely sensitive enough to know how fresh that scent is so I'm pretty sure they can work out whether it's something that they can find right there or if it's something that's a little bit older if you looked at Tingana's behavior a few days ago when he was around and we found then Mvula in the afternoon Tingana was back and forth and striding all over the place and you could see he was visibly agitated by what was going on and so I think it was a situation where he realized that there was definitely a leopard around, a male leopard around, and he was, wasn't was 100% sure which male leopard he was, but he knew that there was a leopard around, and so he kind of had a situation where he was he was trying to find exactly who it was. He knew it was a male, and he was up and down, up and down, and he unfortunately must have lost the scent due to the fact that there was a bit of rain around, and it was a cold, windy day, which would have stirred that scent up, but he definitely became more and more interested. The more he walked towards where Mvula was eventually found in the afternoon, the more kind of hyped up he got, the more he was up and down and really actively trying to find it so I think yes they know how fresh it is they know whether it's something they need to worry about or if it's something that's been a few days before so it's obviously one of those situations that there is some sort of perception I don't think they can tell minutes and hours but definitely whether or not it's something they should pursue or not but look at those orange colors that are slowly starting to come through behind them it's almost a magical scene as the Sun is filtering through those leaves <laughs> so Lily you say exactly how I feel as well you say that Tumba is so handsome and that you absolutely love him well I'm glad that you do Lily he's my favorite cat and he is handsome isn't he he's a very beautiful leopard and I also really love him too so it's a wonderful cat to see and I'm glad that you like him and I'm glad hopefully that it's been an exciting part of your day that you see him and that you really are happy to see our spotted friend
but I think it's just going to get better and better actually this sighting if he just stays there for 15 more minutes 15 to 20 minutes that should become absolutely bright orange behind him and we should get the most deep rich colors kind of coming out and then him just sort of backdropped in, or in the in the foreground of that backdrop so it's going to be wonderful and worth sitting exactly where we are I don't think it's any reason for us to change where we are or move or in any way and so hopefully we're going to get a, a really special treat with Tumbo but like I say you can see the fingers of light now breaking through all of those branches and leaves and it really will be special once that sun just gets a little on the lower side. Mrs. Zero, you're asking why is a leopard not evolved into a family unit or a pride or a herd? Would that not make, well, stand better chance for them to survive? Well, if you think that leopards are probably the most prolific of big cats currently and they're surviving in more areas than any other of the big cats, they are occurring in mountains, riverbeds, savannas, um, near coastlines, in any sort of type of terrain you can think of is a leopard. And so they are in incredibly successful as it is and also there has to be different sort of parts of the ecosystem you can't have everybody being in a pride everybody being together because ultimately it would make life very difficult they'd also have to probably be the size of lions to be able to pull down enough food for everybody and to have that physicality the way that they are is perfectly evolved to survive the way that they need to be so they silent predators they on their own if there was more of them there's more risk that they're going to flush things in thickets and so being on their own is far better they also camouflage incredibly well and so the spotted pattern and kind of the way that they are helps with that and so to be sort of by themselves just works much better in the environments that they like to thrive in and if we had a situation where we put them in prides you probably find they wouldn't be as successful they would require different ecosystems they would then fill a niche that is filled already by coalitions of cheetah or prides of lions and it would make it a lot harder for them to really move around they would be in direct competition with a cat that's much bigger whereas now they've got their own little niche and their own way of doing things and they are incredibly successful at it so being on their own actually works for these guys far better than being in groups and together with others so oh, the lily is just beautiful the only thing that would have made this better is had there been absolutely no grass and no stump on the bottom left to hide his paw but other than that it really is the best sighting that we could have asked for from Tumba. I mean it could have gone onto the dam wall itself and we could have had the orange light but I think it's just wonderful the way he is and I'm certainly happy that he went and lay there and didn't stay where he was just now which was a lot thicker and denser but he is grooming himself which typically means that he's probably not going to be there for much longer I would imagine that he's probably going to move a little bit at some stage and so we'll probably see him if he starts to yawn then we'll know for sure that he is going to come down and start heading somewhere else and what I'm hoping is he's going to cross there's a little gully in front of him and then it comes down onto a shelf and into an area that's a lot more open and if he comes into that area then we are absolutely smiling and he'll be absolutely perfectly placed for our sunset and for us in general because he'll be right out in the open. You can see the shelf is a lot more open than where he's lying at the moment. Oh, just having a little look around. Isn't that beautiful? Look at those eyes and that face. And his nose you can see is still very pink. It is darkened a little bit over the last few months but it is still very pink in comparison to some of the other leopards we see out of here and a lot of people will often think that that's a sign of age it's not actually necessarily true it's a situation that you'll find that some will have more pink noses than other if you look at shadow who's 11 years old hers is still pink and so it's a genetic thing as well now i can hear a barking sound coming from the south of us so I wonder if maybe there's not another leopard lurking around. There's definitely a nyala or a bushbuck barking south of Chitwa Lodge and away from where we are. So I wonder if maybe, just maybe, we have a situation where another leopard might make its way into this area. That would be quite special. So we'll keep an eye out. And while we do that, I believe Jamie is bumbling about the beautiful Mara. And I wonder if she's got her IR light out and whether the sun is completely set. But I'm sure whatever she's doing, it will be magical. Now, 
As we make our way towards wherever Scarface has been hiding, I hear that we have a question from five-year-old Tucker. Now, Tucker, I hope you're still watching, and I hope that you get to hear your question being asked, answered. So Tucker would like to know, and we've got to go back in time to the sighting that we had with the crowned cranes. Tucker would like to know if the, the crown of the crowned crane is fur. So what we'll do is we'll quickly have a look at the bird we were looking at in case any viewers have jumped on board. It is a beautiful drawing of a crowned crane and as you can see it has a distinctive crown and face pattern. Now Tucker you're wondering about this part of the crowned crane and you're wondering if that is fur. It's not fur, it's feathers. So the amazing thing about birds is that they have different types of feathers and some are very long and very sleek and very very strong and those would be feathers that they use for flying but they have different types of feathers just like maybe you you have friends with a cat or a dog or perhaps you've had a cat or a dog you know how they've got very very soft fur around their ears and then they've got slightly rougher fur around their back and then they've got whiskers birds have different types of feathers and in this particular case these feathers are very fluffy and very soft so it's almost like the the down or the the, the feathers that are underneath the feather the, the the larger feathers it's very very fluffy and very very colorful and you'll also find that it'll be quite sensitive because there will be lots of nerves around the base so they'll be able to feel with that crown so there you go Tucker it's not fur, it's type of feathers that are almost like fur. Now, when you look at a bird, you see the sort of the, the sleek feathers on the outside. But underneath this, they've got layers, oopsie, that's a map. They've got, <laughs> they've got layers of feathers. So when you go outside and it's really cold and you put a vest on, so they've got layers of feathers there that help to keep them warm. Fluffy, fluffy, fluffy feathers. And then over the top of that, are the pretty feathers that we see on the outside and the feathers on the top of its head are very similar to that so there you go tucker thank you for sending through your question i hope you've enjoyed your safari keep watching and i look forward to hearing your name again okay onwards to scar who is under that tree uh, which i found is a pretty standard method of of directing people to places so I'm going to I actually I really thought because I saw Taylor up ahead of me I really thought she was going to find Scar before I did but she's gone on which makes me worry that he's moved off but I'm gonna go search let's go and find out where Taylor's bumbling off to well maybe not Jamie I'm now wondering if those vehicles that we saw earlier were looking at Scar but we went around there even off-road a little bit I couldn't see anything but it is a particularly difficult spot because the grass is so long and now it's a horrible time of the day just for my eyes because it's not quite dark enough to use the spotlight yet but also my eyes are starting to play tricks on me oh my goodness are we okay has everything come loose ah my goodness so basically what's happened right now is Jahawi's entire camera has rattled loose and he cannot move the camera at all because the part that he holds on to has fallen off I'm so sorry and this will take uh, basically we'll have to dismantle the entire camera including the infrared lights and everything to be able to fix this <laughs> so funny okay I just I'm literally just watching how he's just got bits of camera just like this anyways okay I'm gonna send you back across to Tristan now while we get all the nuts and bolts tightened Well, I would imagine you would need to get nuts and bolts tightened if you would want to carry on your safari, Taylor, but it, I'm sure that must have made Taylor giggle quite a bit. Tumbo is still sitting in the same place. He's keeping his pose for our sunset. What I might do, VM, is just go back slightly for you, although I see the spike thorn is getting in the way on the right-hand side, just to line up the sun with his face. But that's the spike thorn, the green plant on the right that VM is showing you. And so it's a little, little bit in the way if I go back for VM, so I actually might just stay where I am. The funny thing is, is that that little spike thorn is going to block our perfect sunset because if I go back just a little bit, then the sun will set right behind 
his head. Although he's not looking the most elegant that he's ever looked with his tongue out the way he is. And I wonder why cats do this. They do it regularly. We saw Asana doing it the other day when he was quite hot. And is his tongue hanging out like that as he panted away. And I, and I know the theory behind it and why, but it just seems completely ridiculous when they've got their tongues hanging out. They almost look a little simple when they do that. And you can see there's a little fly on his nose as well, which I'm sure will irritate him a little bit. You might find him just shake his head a little bit to get rid of that fly at some point. But put your tongue away. You don't look the smartest when you have your tongue out. <laughs> Cats will be cats though, and you see it in domestic cats as well, they also do the same thing when they're sleeping. Now I don't know how much longer he's going to be awake for, he's starting to really kind of bob his head and get to that tired kind of phase where he might just flop down, but there's our sunset, is starting to get just better and better. Oh, and the yawn at sunset, oh I was just hoping he was going to throw his head back a little bit further. Maybe he will, maybe he's going to do it for us, but I definitely think our submission for Sunset is as good as any submission could possibly be. I don't really know how much better to make a Sunset than what we've got right there. Like I said, there might have been one or two little things, but it is as spectacular as possible. Now, Megan, who's got the best attitude, votes Team Tumba, and so we'll go with Megan as well. I'm a Team Tumba man as well, we know Viem is too. And he's busy watching a water buck that's actually crossing the dam wall at the moment. So there's a water buck that is walking slowly across the dam wall. And that's why Tumba is looking so intently as the water buck comes across from Chitwa Lodge. There it is. So that is directly across from where Tumba is. And that water buck probably has no idea that Tumba is even here. He's got a very good idea that the water buck is there because it's right out in the open. And if he sees a baby water buck in amongst that, you might find that his reaction will be slightly different but there we go look how he's watching there's a lot more intent in his eyes now than what he was showing two seconds ago with a tongue out and eyes closed he looks a lot more focused and a lot more like a leopard and less like a dopey character oh but that is just absolutely perfect look at the light behind him it's gold 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 Riti, no, I don't think the green in his eyes helps with better night vision. At the end of the day, you'll find that all of these leopards have very good night vision. Now look, you see, he's changed his position. Oh, and it's actually even better for us. His paws are out now. His head's a little bit behind the grass, but paws are out. But at the end of the day, all leopards have to survive and have to move around out here and be effective in the night. And so whether their eyes are brown, yellow, green, blue, whatever the color may be, They've all got to work in the same way and they've all got to be able to see at night. And so, no, I don't think eyes are better color or green is a better color because then leopards would have evolved with all of them to have green eyes. I think it's more about the cells that are in those eyes. And so you find he's got more kind of, he's got more rods than cones. And the same as any other leopard, they'll have a high percentage of rods, which allows them to see much better at night than during the day or to see color like we see during the day. But I think that water buck's onto something. The water buck has just stopped and looking at all of us. And oh, look at that. How nice is that? Orange, orange, orange backdrop to a beautiful young male leopard. It is absolutely perfect. Now we just need him to do a nice big yawn for us in that orange light. And I think we've absolutely nailed it. The thing is with that water buck is that water buck is far too big for him so there's no ways that he can really go after that water buck I mean, he's even though he's a developing young man and he's you know he's getting much bigger and much stronger and more powerful thomas you were wondering about this as well but he, he's just not going to be powerful enough just yet for something of that size also he doesn't have the technique just yet you know at the end of the day he's still learning he's a young leopard he's only just started hunting for himself and so that's a bit more than he can probably chew going after something like that and so he's going to have to have a situation where he's going to have to just learn a little bit and start honing and sharpening his teeth and claws so to speak on small animals like impalas and dikers and steenbok and scrub hares and those kind of things and eventually in time he can then graduate to water buck and he can be like his dad who is an effective water buck hunter I've seen Tinga Tingana and Mbul actually depending on which one it is it could be any of them or quarantine even could be his dad I doubt it but it's possible and you might find a situation that any one of those would go after water buck well I've seen all of them go after water buck before and so you know at the end of the day 
he will go after those things later in life, but it's probably a little on the big side for him at this stage of the game. Oh, look at that. Look at that. See how he's watching the water buck? He's watching the water buck run away now because there's a vehicle crossing the dam wall and so the water buck is trotting back towards the, da the lodge itself. And that's why he's watching with eyes so intently. Wow, that is absolutely stunning. Spoilt is what we are being by the sighting, that is for sure. It is not in any way disappointed. And he never does, to be honest. He's, he's a curious cat and constantly seems like he's up to something. I was saying to Viem when we were off air, because obviously Viem was in Kenya and hasn't spent nearly as much time with Tamba as maybe Sebastian or Senzo or the guys that have been here for quite a long time during the sort of Mara season. And I was saying to him, the one thing I love about Tamba is that it's very seldom that he sleeps for long periods of time. He tends to watch things, he looks at things, he generally gives you something all the time. And so I like spending time with him for that reason. He's not a cat that tends to sleep all the time. He often is, has his eyes open and watching and looking at the birds that fly over, looking at the insects, listening. Um, he likes to take in his environment. He's often actually quite even interactive with us. He often stares at us as like when we found him. He was looking up at us with his big eyes, just kind of watching and taking it easy and really looking. So he's a, he's a great cat to spend a lot of time with and, and I really enjoy every sighting I have with him. Not only because he's a spectacular looking individual, but because he does have a bit of character to him and he tends to always be up to something. And, and Hosanna is also very similar in that regard. Hosanna also gets up to a lot. And, but he, I see Hosanna starting to edge into more the bad ways of the older male leopards. Oh, this is a very brave dove that just flew over his head. Edging more into the ways of the older males and getting a lot more kind of stationary and sleepy as the days are going on and he's getting a little older. Sorry, Vim. So I'm sorry about that. I just took my foot off the brake and it just lurched forward a little bit. I do apologize. Oof, look at that. Those eyes are just magnificent. Can you imagine when he's a fully grown seven, eight year old male what he's going to look like. He's going to be bulky, he's going to be big, and I think with a few more scars, he's going to be one of those leopards that's really going to stand out as an incredibly looking individual, or incredible looking individual, should I say. Oof. Sun is getting to the right color now. It's that more orange coloration, and there's kind of really a little fireball in the sky, and as we go back out, you can see it's almost down. I don't think we're going to get too much more light, unfortunately. I think it's going to get to a situation where it's probably going to fade away fairly soon. And maybe that yawning is a sign that he's going to get up and start moving. I think this might be a situation where he might come out a little bit. And like I say, hopefully he'll come and sit. There's a little ledge here, and if he can sit there for us, that's just going to be the most spectacular place for him to go. I think the flies are also a bit irritating him a bit, and you can see ears are twitching, faces are twitching, a bit of a yawn. So it seems like he's almost at that point where he might decide to move a little bit and head in a different direction. Hopefully it's, like I say, up towards the dam wall, because it will be beautiful up there if he does head that way. What are you biting? Right, now, while Tumba, oh, there we go, now he's up and moving, and so let's see if he's going to come straight towards us. Looks like he might. It seems as though he's going to come and say hello. Hello, boy. Are you going to come and be friends with us? Are you going to come and introduce yourself to Viem? Hmm? There we go. He is literally, I would say from me, maybe not even one meter. Hello, boy. There's the side of the car. <laughs> Are you curious about the back of our car? How cool is that? So <laughs> epic. Every time I see a leopard that close, it just gets better. And you can see he's now going to sit right next to the car. Is that where you've decided you want to be? A hey, young man? Okay. You're welcome to be wherever you want. I think he might drink, so I'm just going to go forward. Sorry, Viem. Let's just go forward here quickly. Sorry. I'm just going to try and get into a situation where... We can get ourselves into a little bit of a better spot for him to drink because he's in a little kind of thicket there. It's not a great place. I don't think there's much water for him. So he's looking and trying to kind of scan around. But there we go. How's that? That's pretty special. We kind of eye level with him as he's looking for water and trying to find a spot just to drink out of. That's absolutely perfect. How cool is that? That is so epic.
So we chose a good spot to kind of position ourselves, I think. He's just kind of settling. But the problem is, is there's not much water there, unfortunately, so it's not the best place for him to drink. He needs to find maybe a little bit of a better spot, and then he'll be able to drink a lot better than that. See, he's just looking at all these little puddles. Graham, you say he's so full, he's struggling to walk. Well, he is, isn't he? He's very full. So I wonder if after a drink he might lead us back to wherever he's been and maybe we'll find a kill somewhere here that he's had and has been feeding on over the last little bit. That's what I'm hoping, at least. he's found himself a little bit of water now to drink it's not the best place though there's a much better place not far from where we are behind us a little bit so if he just walked and crossed this big open clearing there's actually a nice little puddle behind that he could drink at a lot more effectively the thing is is that this water is probably very nice it's seeping from the dam this is seepage that's coming through the dam wall and out the back and so the water is probably very clean from going through all of this sand and soil and substrate and that means that it probably tastes a lot better than anything else and we've seen things like twin dams at the moment doesn't look great and so these are probably a lot better places for him to try and drink from He's just figuring out a way to get out of the mud while he's sort of walking along because there's one thing that a cat doesn't like is mud and there we go off we go again I think he might find somewhere just to lie down he's heading back to where that water buck was walking there he goes across a little eroded section so behind the dam wall and in front of the car and isn't that cool it's just so epic <laughs> he's such a champion cat I absolutely love spending time with this guy. He's just always so obliging to us. And I love how he just also just slowly ambles. He's really got nowhere to go. He's not a territorial individual yet. He doesn't have to worry about finding himself a place to go and scent mark or anything like that. He can just kind of stroll around and, well, go into a little drainage ditch if he wants to and go and have a little look at a three-banded plover that's walking behind him as well. Are you going to chase the three-banded plover? Don't chase the three-banded plover. Don't be naughty. Leave the three-banded plover alone. At the end of the day, it doesn't need to be hunted. Maybe the little plover's got eggs. It's going to be interesting to see what the plover does because the plover is almost staring in the face of danger. And look at his tail. His tail is twitching as though he wants to kind of go towards it. And we might see the little plover fly away so shortly. Has it got a little insect in its mouth or what is that? Seems as though it's got something. There he comes, he's out now and sniffing around, obviously not too perturbed by this little plover behind it. I wonder if he's smelling Hosanna or maybe another leopard around here. At the end of the day, there's some very kind of pungent scents maybe left behind by them. Hosanna's been spending lots of time here, and so maybe that's who he's picking up the scent. I hear his mom was found not far from where we are now, just north of us, and so maybe, just maybe, there's a situation where she might come down this way, so we'll just have to hold thumbs. But while we sit with Tumba, I believe Jamie is negotiating the Masai Mara darkness with her spotlight. And I wonder what little creatures are in store for her tonight as she waves about her spotlight for eyes. Enjoying a really lovely scene with Tumba and him relaxing and having a drink, and I really miss him. I can imagine that he must be looking absolutely enormous now. The last time I saw him, he was all ears and all feet and bright green eyes. I definitely miss that little leopard. No, while, we, while you've been with Tristan, we've been searching for Scar. We haven't had any luck, I'm afraid. I think he must have gone wandering towards the river. Um, that lioness that we were with, the reason that we didn't continue to follow her, just so that you know, is because she went across the boundary between the off-roading zone and the non-off-roading zone. So she went beyond our 
beyond our reach and away from where we could follow her. But that's where she vanished off to. Uh, it's been an absolute joy getting to know the different animals in the Mara. And one of the things that we did do when we arrived was to approach the various researchers. And Graham, you're wondering if we share information of interesting sightings or strange behavior with researchers. We do. We absolutely do. I, um, when I was sitting with Imani, the, the female cheetah, a few week, a few days ago, not a few weeks ago, a few days ago, I was actually chatting away to the lady who runs the, the Mara Cheetah Project, and we were talking about her, Imani's curious behavior and having a good giggle. And I promised her that I will send her that footage when I have a moment to. So yes, we do, absolutely. Um, and we, of course, in turn, pick their brains uh, in terms of of getting to know the various animals in a region, uh, getting to understand, deepen our knowledge as well. And the Mara is a really, it is the home of some really very solid research that goes on. The, the hyena project, the lady who runs it has been here researching hyenas for the last 30 years. So you can imagine, it's a, it's a wealth of information that is out there. And it's really deep, I speak per, from a personal perspective, it's really deepened my understanding of the way that everything works. And it's something that I hope we will be able to do even more in the future. So yes, absolutely. They've all, Mara Lion Project, the hyenas, the cheetah ladies, they've all been fantastic to us. And the same applies, by the way, back in, um, back in South Africa. So there is a, a database that's been put together by Panthera, which is a, a big, pack, big cat organization, but it, or research organization, but it does a huge amount with other species as well. And after every sighting, the, oh, bug in my eye, the interesting stuff that we've seen is recorded in the database along, even if we, even if it's not interesting behavior, even if it's just a sighting, um, we, I'm just trying to get this bug out, we record everything, the GPS coordinates get recorded, and we then pass that sightings da data onto the research organization at the end of every month. Ow. Remove the eye. Thanks, Ferg. I appreciate the offer, but I, I think that might be a bit drastic at this point. Somewhere in my bag of tricks, I've got eye drops for this exact reason, because the bugs at the moment are relatively... Oh, there's my wallet. Probably shouldn't leave that when I go on leave. Huh. Here we go. You see, it all worked out quite fortuitously. Okay, I'm going to try and wash this bug out of my eye. While we do, we'll send you across to Taylor, who fortunately, I, I believe, has two functioning good eyes. Ow. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. For now. We all know that I have a history with getting bugs in my eyes, so Jamie, I hope that you manage to get it out swiftly because there's a, there's few things that are as unpleasant as a, a big beetle smacking you in the eye and then straight after a little midge getting in there. It's not very nice, but uh, I'm sure I'll be joining you shortly because there's not a drive that goes by that I don't have any insects in my eyes. And also, I'm now blind from the sun. I looked at it. Don't look at the sun. Very silly of me. So we're just checking for things. Now, Ridgely, you're wondering if there's any bees here. Well, no, not now. It's night time. So bees don't typically fly around at night unless they somehow managed to get attracted to a light and then didn't get home safely. But yeah, there are. There are actually plenty of bees. I had a hive outside my room. And I didn't mind it, but then those bees started getting a bit hectic and they were trying to get into my tent and we decided the best thing to do would be to remove it. So we got uh, bee removalists in. They came through, they took the hive away and they didn't move it too far, a couple of kilometers away or so. Uh, a lot of the locals have beehives and things, so they just re basically relocated the entire nest, which was really cool. So I'm sure that they're still around making lots and lots of honey. They're not going to bother me and sting anybody in camp. Uh, we've got a couple of people who are allergic to bees. So that's one of the reasons why we moved them, but they're so important to the ecosystem. 
Uh, they're beautiful little creatures. I like it when all the flowers are around and you get to see them. I don't like it when they fly near me, however, because they always sting me. Oh my goodness! Mr. P, you've just reminded me. It's Halloween, isn't it? And you were wondering, it is, eh? Is it the 30th? Yeah. It's the 30th today. And you were wondering if we celebrate Halloween. Uh, it's not huge in South Africa. There are definitely some people that do it. I think I went trick-or-treating. Oh, is it tomorrow, the 31st? Not not today. What is that? It's a bone. Sorry, I thought it was a snake stand. Oh, oh reared up. No, it's, so it's tomorrow, the 31st. Thank you, Megan. Uh, yeah, so I didn't really. I, went, I think I went trick-or-treating twice growing up. My mom's not a fan of it, spoils thought. So, <laughs> but otherwise, I, I do all sorts of silly things. Last year, some of you may remember Halloween. Who remembers what I did for Halloween? If you remember what I did for Halloween, maybe you can share the pictures. I've just seen some eyes in the grass, but now our only problem is I'm not really gonna be able to do much about it because I, uh, Obviously, we had a problem earlier where the camera fell apart. Now, we haven't been able to put our infrared lights back on. I'm just trying to see. It's, we haven't really got a spot that we can even climb up. It's quite far off the road. We're not going to see it with a camera, I'm afraid. I think it could be. It looks too big to be a serval. I think it might just be an antelope or something just sitting in the grass. But we will just leave it. So, unfortunately, we haven't got our infrared light back on. And I'm trying to drive as slowly as possible so the camera doesn't fall apart again. <laughs> and it's either that, either we're going to have no camera or the car is going to stop working. One of the two, I'm not sure what's going to happen. Maybe it all happens at the same time. But it has not been a great day for me <laughs> in terms of things breaking. I seem to just touch everything and then it falls apart. I don't know why. I have absolutely no idea why. So we're going to keep trying to find some animals around here that we can view with the spotlight um, and hopefully we will. I'm going to send you back to South Africa. Tumba's had a drink of water and he's now on the move. Well, he is moving, but before we do anything, earlier I showed you a very brave three-banded plover and I've just found its nest with its eggs. So there the eggs are just in this clump over here very well camouflaged and you can see them just there so note to your left Vim there we go in there so you see two little round eggs there they are so incredibly well camouflaged just like the little nest that it's built you can see it's pushed little bits together and it's laid its two eggs perfectly there and that is why this little plover or lapwing I mean, no, plover, should I say, it's not a lapwing, is being so brave in the face of a leopard. And I'm surprised Tumba didn't pick it up, and I'm surprised also that, well, I'm glad that when we came in here that we missed that egg and that nest site because it is almost impossible to see. Had it not been for the little bird going towards it, and there we go, look, she's going to sit on top of it, or he, whichever one, you know, be male and female, and there we go, it's just going to get everything sorted out, make sure all the eggs are together. How cool is this? <laughs> that is so special. We'll have to keep monitoring this little nest and check it day to day until we see the little lapwing chicks. It's going to be super cool to see this. This is honestly the first three-banded plover nest that I've, ever, that I've seen. I don't know why I keep calling it a lapwing. I think it's just the plover lapwing name is getting into my brain a little bit, but it is a three-banded plover, not a lapwing. Please don't quote me on these things. I don't know why I'm saying them, but that is just so cool. And there we go. It's sitting on it and just kind of getting into the right place, just turning the eggs a little bit, making sure it warms them properly. Tony, you say you can't believe how nice that camouflage is for the eggs. Isn't it amazing? Isn't nature incredible? The way that this little bird knows what its eggs are going to look like and how to camouflage them and make sure that they are in a nest that is made up of a similar material to the color of her eggs is absolutely fascinating and completely amazing. I cannot believe actually how well she's managed to bring those sticks together and if you look at the area around her it looks like just little bits of driftwood. It doesn't look as though there's anything major here, it just looks like water has washed that all together but that has most definitely been built. She's taken sticks and precariously placed them and touched, put them in the right places in order to construct 
this beautiful little nest that is on the ground and to make it blend in as much as possible. That's the idea. She's trying to make it blend so that if a predator comes along, something like a mongoose, a monitor lizard, because remember she's going to have lots of those near water, she has a situation where she needs to walk away and move and nothing's going to be able to see it. So she has to construct something that looks just like the rest of the environment and she's done an absolutely beautiful job and has made the most perfect little nest. So cool. Look at that camouflage. M Mac, you're saying does she have hiccups? No, I think she's being as brave as brave can be. I think she knows there's these big hulking vehicles, there's a leopard around, and so she's trying to protect her eggs and she's trying to kind of display it in the hope that the attention will be drawn to her and then if she can get up off the eggs, she can move off and be able to take our attention with it and we go with her. So that's what she's trying to do, or he, like I said, it's difficult to say whether it's a male or female, they are identical at the end of the day, but I would imagine it's a female. And that's what, so the head bobbing is just to be able to kind of draw attention uh, and I'm really surprised that it's come and lay on its eggs when we're so close I mean there's two vehicles around this nest and she's in no way bothered by us at all I suppose it's also it's getting to that time of the night where she has to start trying to protect them and warm them and make sure that she keeps them you know sort of nice and warm and an optimal temperature that the sun has gone down now so that's maybe why she's fighting fear in order to sit on them. Now Kaylin you're asking what are the advantages to nesting on the ground? Well some birds are just not built to be in trees. They're not designed. This is a bird that spends all its life wading through the shallows of water and so it doesn't have a foot structure in order to perch on a tree and therefore building a nest in a tree is going to be pretty difficult because it's not going to be able to really grip to be able to build very well. So it's a water bird. It's designed to be near water and generally near water means not too much cover and so they have to work on other ways to be able to be successful and so they build nests like this that are all camouflaged now the advantage of doing that it's interesting I don't know if there is many advantages to being on the ground at the end of the day she's got a lot more problems than a bird that nests in a tree she's got to deal with not only all kinds of predators but vehicles like us driving around and I mean you would never know if this bird was not sitting right there you would have no idea that there are eggs there firstly the secondly that the situation that you know you you She's got to deal with elephants and waterbuck and impalas and all these other animals that walk around here that might squash the eggs in some way. And so there's not really too many advantages, to be honest, other than the fact that she just has the most incredible camouflage for eggs. And that's why you find any bird that nests on the ground, their eggs are perfect for the environment that they spend time in. So you'll find perfectly colored eggs, whereas a lot of the other birds that are tree nesters, their eggs to be tend to be quite brightly colored so something like an aramark babbler will have a bright sort of powder blue colored egg whereas these ones are these absolutely perfectly colored gray eggs now the thing is is that i can't move now that this other vehicle's moved i can i can't go anywhere to show you tumba because at the end of the day he's behind me over there and can see him just tucked in a little thicket he's just watching and is completely non-phased by a little plover and its eggs he's watching something else and is looking down the other way and so I can't really go anywhere and also don't want to drive anywhere near this bird I want it to settle down and to spend its time where it is so I think I'm just going to reverse back slightly and hope that this little bird doesn't move but that is one of the most coolest finds and like I say it's something that we can follow that's the nice thing about this is it's, it's something that we can develop into a little story the trials and tribulations of a little plover. Now it's off its nest again so I just want to get one last look. I know it's not ideal for it to be off its nest but one last look at those eggs and just how well they blend in with the environment. Look at that. Is that not amazing? I find that absolutely unbelievable. I think it's incredible that there's nature has a design on an egg that matches the rest. Right, while I marvel at this little plover and her bravery and her cleverness to be able to build something as intricate as that to have camouflage her eggs. Let's go back across to Jamie Patterson who's got her spotlight out still and hasn't had much luck yet. So you'll be all very relieved I'm sure and, and able to breathe easier that my eye is absolutely fine. It's, it's, it's a little scratchy but all is well and it, it comes as a price that we pay for holding up a large light in our hands in front of our faces. Um, and then complete with the light that's behind me so that you can actually see me chatting to you. Uh, the combination is, is a special one for attracting all sorts of insects. Luckily, we like insects. And we're not bothered by it. 
Uh, unfortunately, the search for, for Scar failed, but we do have a question from Snazzy, which is a great name. Snazzy, I don't know how much longer Scar will live. He is an older lion, and he has been injured many times in the past. Apparently, he's limping quite badly at the moment. The last few times I've seen him, he's been looking a little thin. Not, not, not definitely not in, in any dire straits, but he has been looking a little thin. I, I don't know. And of course, the, there, there's two different approaches between the Kenyan and the South African approach to conservation. And especially for a lion like Scar, who's garnered so much public attention, uh, when he is injured, he, he often receives veterinary attention almost immediately and of course it's he's around these these areas where people visit a lot it's a it's an area that's very popular within the mara triangle and as a result he he gets noticed and and he does he does get treated so i don't know um i, I would say that he is getting old he is reaching the end of his life but it could be anywhere from the next six months to the next two three years it's impossible for me to really predict and it would be a very silly thing for me to do to actually predict when i think he's he's going to eventually leave the mara the other thing is of course remember that this is such a massive open ecosystem that he there we don't know exactly what young males are about where they might for example young males could disperse from the conservancies so we we don't know what's coming his way and we don't know what challenge he's going to face but the fact that there's four of them within that coalition known as the musketeers just because you know confusion so the lion musketeers as opposed to the cheetah musketeers now there's four of them and the rest of the other three males are also very strong and healthy and fit males so i don't know i have absolutely no idea I also haven't spent very much time with him, to be honest. A lot of the time he's across the river. Oh, I thought somebody was coming up behind me. Which should be unusual because we're actually the only people out at this time of day. Would be very Halloweenish. Would be very appropriate. I feel quite sad I'm missing out on all of the Halloween festivities tomorrow. Oh well. I have to send my dog a happy birthday wish as well. Yes, I will. All right, as we go off into the darkness, searching with our spotlight, Taylor's doing something very similar. I don't know where she is, but let's see if she's managed to spot you anything. We have, we have, but it's about to disappear. We have a serval. Go, serval, go. It's a very skittish one. We'll see if we can get another view. Uh, it's... Yeah, I think we might. I'm just going to give it a little bit of room and see if it will go. I see, unfortunately, the sighting would be a lot better. And I think that the serval would... I think, no, it's, I thought there were two for a second, but it was just the eyes that were moving. Uh, the serval would be a lot more relaxed, I reckon, if we didn't have the spotlight on it. It's a little bit nervous, but, I mean, it's a small cat. It's right down quite low on the uh, predator hierarchy, so it's better that it does stay hidden. So we won't stay for long. I'll just try and get us one more view because they're just so beautiful. And they are very pretty, of course, when we have the spotlight on because their colors are just unbelievable. It's hiding in this grass now. Let's see if he's gonna come out. Let me just go here. I'm trying to keep a bit of distance, but then we also, of course, struggle though. Oh, it's hiding. It's in there. You can just see the reflection. To the, a little bit to the right. There you go, it's gonna move. You've got it, it is there. It's um, basically straight in. There we go. Can you see its ear? That's incredible. I hope that you can spot that. That's not a scrub hair, by the way. Those big ears belong to the serval. Just hiding the grass. You can see it's just moving. This is incredible. I mean, you would walk right past this cat. If you didn't have a spotlight or you wouldn't see it where it was, I have no idea that it was here. It's completely hidden. So that's what they do. And they do feel a little bit nervous. And you can see I have lifted the light off it quite a bit. So the main part of the beam is, is not striking it directly. You never want that to happen anyway when you're viewing animals with a spotlight. You just want to put a little bit on them. But when they do feel threatened, we know that they've got the most amazing camouflage. 
and they'll just sit right down on the grass and sit very, very still. There it goes, there it goes. It's thinking away. Well, it can't be too nervous. It's stopping and grooming itself every now and then. Very leopard-like, though, the way it creeps on the ground. It will be out looking for all sorts of things to eat tonight. There's so many rodents around here. I can't tell you how many little mice and rats and things I've already see running, seen running across the road. So hopefully the serval cat is successful and manages to uh, catch something a little bit later. But always very, very nice to see. And I, I wonder, I don't think Sebastian got to see serval before he leaves. I know he leaves tomorrow from the Mara. That's a bit sad. And I've been lucky the last couple of evenings in a row now I've had a serval. Wow, what a nice surprise. Okay, now I'm going to try and get out of here without falling into a hole. Oh, I'm in low range. Whew. Goodness, I almost shot off like a rocket. That was very, very cool. Hey, how nice is that? Because I was a little bit sad. So I just need to have a talking to this, this car. Sometimes it doesn't behave. Actually, it's still there. Let's see if we can get another... Mm. Bumpy, sorry. I hope the camera doesn't break again and fall apart. Jar just shouts if it does. <laughs> if it collapses, let me know. We'll get one last view and then I'll let the servo go. No, we're not. It's running. It's run away from us. That's okay. We'll let it go. Bye, servo. Thank you very much for showing up, though, to the party. Very, very nice. Maybe Jamie can get it on the way back if she comes this way, or she has to come this way. She might see it, and maybe she can try with the infrared. Jamie also absolutely loves servals, but it's hard not to love them, though, when you see those beautiful creatures. Wonderful. Well, we got lucky, didn't we? That was a nice surprise. I, I thought we were going to have a catless drive, but serval saved the day. Let's jump back on board with my dear friend Tristan. He's sitting with Tumba and he's got a nice close-up to show you. We do. We have the best close-up possible. And he's having a little nap and, oh no, he's just closed his eye. I was hoping he was going to stay the way he was because VM had framed up his eye beautifully as he was staring off into the distance. He's just moved himself a little bit and is now settled on top of one of the little shelves that we have around here. There's his head up again. So he might look in this direction. Hopefully he does because he's got these beautiful big blue eyes that were looking, or green eyes should I say, that were looking straight at us at one point. And VM was just getting the most ridiculous close up. You could actually even see a little kind of thing dangling. I didn't know if it was a fly at first. We thought it was a fly kind of flying around his eye, but it was actually something hanging off his whisker and it was right in the sort of around the, the eye and you could actually see the shadow on the eye itself. And it was just pretty much a full frame of just one of his eyes, which is very cool. So hopefully he will decide to look in our direction again and we'll be able to get another little view. But I think what he's done is he's put his paw there and now he can kind of balance his head on his paw and have a little relax as the night sets in. At the end of the day, it's now time for him to have a really good nap. It's not quite dark just yet, but he's had a little drink. He's had a little wander around. I think if we come here tomorrow, we should be able to find Tumba. I don't think he's going to go far, unless another leopard comes through here, in which case it might be a bit different. But there you go. There's a unique view into a leopard's ear. You can see the little tunnel where it goes down and the canals into the inner ear and how that hair funnels the sound deeper into the ear and so that it can hear better. So a really nice, unique look into a leopard's ear as well. We always at different angles, and being a little bit lower, sometimes you get to see things. You can see how it turns and adjust for him to be able to hear a little bit better. I think he's just trying to get himself a bit more comfy. I don't think he's chosen the best spot. <laughs> Shame boy, is it uncomfy up there? But there you can see he's kind of resting on his paw and just really having a perfect little nap. That's absolutely amazing. Now, there are a whole host of vehicles that are wanting to come to the sighting, so ultimately I am going to have to leave him in the next few minutes. I don't think we're going to be able to stay much longer. It's all the guys that are returning back to their lodges and particularly Chitwa. So there's three vehicles that want to come here and ultimately we've spent a lot of time with Tumba this afternoon and we've kept another number of people at bay. So I think we're going to take one last look at him and then we're going to just move off and leave the rest of the guys to come in and make their way towards the sighting. Wonderful, but tomorrow morning, I think this is one of the first places I'm going to start because at the end of the day, I don't see Tumba moving much at all. I think if we clever about what we do tomorrow and we come and check carefully around here, I think we might find him sitting in a very similar area. He's a leopard that doesn't seem to move a lot as I was 
referring to earlier in the drive and so I'm pretty sure that if we go and we head into that area we should be able to find him again or well, this area I don't know why I said that area but we should be able to find him right while I start heading back home and heading back towards well the center of Juma and away from Chitwa let's go back across to Jamie and see if that spotlight has found anything yet and hopefully it will soon searching for well anything that we can find you but unfortunately we haven't had much luck but I just wanted on my last drive for now I, I probably depending on what happens I'm not going to I'm probably not going to be seeing you for another two weeks unless something changes tomorrow morning but in theory I won't be seeing you for two weeks so it's as always been a lovely work cycle we'll be back in the Mara after our trip to Uganda, which will be shared with Rebecca and with Batman as well. Not the actual Batman, Craig. Craig the Batman. So we're very, very excited. Hopefully I come back with lots of stories to tell you about the different birds and, and creatures that we see there. Especially at the, at the backpackers and on, on the island we're staying at. I'm sure we're going to find and observe all sorts of interesting things. But it has been wonderful and I just wanted to thank you for now I'm not going in I'm not going permanently just to avert panic that often happens I'm not going I'm just going on leave I'm just going on holiday a bit of rest a bit of relaxation a huge amount of fast food it's going to be my plan over the next four days in Nairobi a lot of fast food as much as I can possibly get my hands on it's weird when you can't have something you kind of want it much at all. Okay, well, if, if it's all right with Megan, I think that that pretty much concludes our, our Mara portion of this evening's sunset safari. Oh, okay. Ch changed my mind. <laughs> all right, we're going to we're going to be saying farewell to you for this evening. I'll catch up with you in two weeks time. I hope you have a wonderful time. We're going to send you back over to Tristan so that he can finish off the sunset safari. Well, indeed, it's time to say goodbye. Unfortunately, we don't have much time left at all. I've just come out of where Tambe is, and so I'm going to stop here so that I can give you my undivided attention as we start to head home. I just don't want to stop too low down in case a signal goes. Although, I've, well, what am I worried about? There is now a big kind of tower behind me that has got all kinds of equipment that allows me to be able to speak to all of you from here it's gone of the days where this used to be a dodgy signal area and happiness that it was like that because otherwise we wouldn't have had the magical sighting that we had of Tumba this afternoon it would have been a no-go zone for us a few months ago so it's a wonderful addition to have Chitwa and it's such a great place at this time of the year when it's dry and, and there's not much going on so it's been an epic day we've had some crazy cool little things happening today lots of interesting little stuff as well as the beautiful Tumba and in the Mara seems as though lots has happened so from myself Taylor Jamie all the cam ops and Megan it's been a pleasure we'll see you tomorrow on the sunrise safari mm -hmm.